Yesterday, a House Government Reform Subcommittee heard about the program from an Assistant Defense Secretary and other military representatives. Connecticut Representative Chris Shays chairs the three-hour hearing. Good morning. I'd like to call this hearing to order. This morning, we begin the subcommittee's oversight of the Department of Defense, DOD, force-wide anthrax vaccine immunization program, AVIP. We begin with questions. Why now? Why this vaccine? Why a mandatory program? And why would active duty reserve and National Guard personnel jeopardize their military careers and even their liberty rather than take the vaccine? After what has been described as a multi-year and deliberative, but for the most part, closed process, DOD launched the AVIP in 1997. But anthrax was a known threat in the 1991 Gulf War. Vaccine development and acquisition against biological threats have been an explicit element of U.S. force protection policy since 1993. Yet only now has anthrax been deemed the preemptive threat requiring the preeminent pre threat requiring this additional medical force protection measure unique to that single organism. If, as has been argued, it would be irresponsible, even immoral, not to use the available vaccine, what took so long? To meet tomorrow's very real threat of biological weapons, cocktails, and genetically altered anthrax strains, DOD selected the vaccine approved by the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, almost 30 years ago. It has been described as, a, as crude and dated medical technology. The sole production plant in, is under renovation to address serious failures to follow good manufacturing practices, which in turn can affect vaccine purity, potency, and safety. Is that the best we can do? The missing element of the mandatory anthrax vaccine program is trust. Radiation testing, Agent Orange, the reckless use of experimental drugs, and mysterious Gulf War illnesses have made military men and women understandably distrustful of the Pentagon, Pentagon on medical matters. Although DOD appears to acknowledge the problem, AVIP brochures and websites still seem heavy-handed and one-sided glossing over legitimate concerns about the safety and efficacy of the vaccine, minimizing adverse reaction reports, and blaming the Internet for fanning dissent. But it's what they don't find on the, on the Internet that gives many pause. There are no long-term studies of anthrax vaccine. Limited use by veterinarians and researchers since 1970 does not provide the statistical weight to project the vaccine's effectiveness, effect, excuse me, in 2.4 million young men and women. After vaccinating 150,000 Gulf War troops, DOD had a unique pool of subjects to study, but due to poor record keeping, no large scale research has been conducted. So those being ordered to take the vaccine face a profoundly personal choice, whether or not to put something in their bodies they fear may do more harm than good. After military service, the uniform comes off but the anthrax vaccine stays with you for life. It's just not the committed commitment many dedicated men and women made to their country when they volunteered for military service. We arrive at this inquiry after traveling a road that began for many veterans in the toxic battlefields of the Gulf War, where they were exposed to multiple vaccines, experimental anti-nerve agent pills and botulism toxoid vaccine, depleted uranium, low levels of chemical warfare agents, pesticides, oil fire smoke, and more. We will follow it until we are sure medical force protection means assuring the long-term health of U.S. forces, not just short-term mission capability. Again, thanks to all our witnesses for being here today. We look forward uh, to your testimony. I'd like to uh, uh, acknowledge uh, um, Mrs. Leighton. Would you like a Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I want to congratulate you for uh, spearheading this effort in Congress, uh, doing these uh, hearings as a wife of a Vietnam veteran who had uh, many of his uh, uh, friends uh, uh, subjected to Agent Orange and having our military uh, deny 
uh, this existence for, for many years. We want to uh, work, I want to commend you for uh, being on the cutting edge of this issue, and I look forward to hearing from our uh, expert uh, panelists uh, to uh, find out uh, what the proper role of this vaccine is in today's uh, military forces. So thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, we have a testimony in our first of two panels, Dr. Sue Bailey, Assistant Secretary for Health Affairs, U.S. Department of Defense, accompanied by, and I believe will be providing uh, brief comments as well, Lieutenant General Ronald R. Blank, uh, United States Army, Deputy Surgeon General Todd Fisher, United States Navy, Lieutenant General Char Charles H. Roadman, the second United States Air Force. Uh, we welcome all of our, our witnesses, and uh, as is the custom, we um, would invite you to stand and to take the oath. Raise your right arm, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Note for the record that our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. And uh, let me say, uh, Ms. Bailey, before recognizing you, Dr. Bailey, excuse me, um, that we have very tough questions. Uh, we have very real questions to ask. But uh, this committee has not concluded one way or the other uh, about this issue. So um, we have an open mind and uh, look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Ms. Bailey, Dr. Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Leitman, other distinguished members of the committee. Uh, anthrax has been identified by the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff as a major threat to American forces. It is lethal, it is easily made, and it's easily weaponized. My mission at Health Affairs is to support force protection through force health protection. Specifically, that means providing for protection from all sources, including chemical and biological weapons. Anthrax is a safe vaccine and it is efficacious. But you should realize that it is not a medical program, that this program is a line commander's program supported by military medicine. It is their responsibility also to provide for the safety of troops and as well to complete their military mission. Total force anthrax vaccine immunization involved a deliberate and detailed process that resulted in the decision by the Secretary of Defense in May of 1998 to immunize the total force. Prior to that, in December of 1997, a total plan was approved by the Secretary upon four conditions being met. Those conditions were that there was supplemental testing above and beyond that of the production uh, facility and the FDA, that there was implementation of a service-wide plan for implementation of the vaccine program, as well as communication to our forces, families, and those concerned. The third condition was that there was a information technology tracking system to allow us an overview and a tracking of each of these immunizations as they were provided. And fourth, that there was an independent review provided, and that if all these conditions were met, we would proceed with total force vaccination. In fact, all of those conditions were met and we proceeded with total force immunization. We are deeply committed at the Department of Defense to force health protection. We are proud of the anthrax vaccine immunization program, which as you see, has now provided immunizations for over 634,000 of our troops with very few adverse reactions. At this point, the rate is 0.007 percent. That is much lower than most of the vaccine immunization programs that you may be well aware of, those for children and infants, for instance, and for many Americans. At this point, adverse reactions stand at 42 out of 223,000 individuals and a total of over 600,000 actual immunizations given. We believe the efforts that we have undertaken, in fact, set the standards as we provide force health protection in a new era of chem bio weaponization. And we are very fortunate to have this vaccine. And in fact, it would be irresponsible were we not using it at this time to protect our troops. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Um, we'll go first to you, uh, 
General Blank, and then to uh, uh, Surgeon General Fisher, and uh, then General Roadman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members, thank you for the opportunity of appearing uh, to deal with the uh, issues and concerns, which I think in your opening comment you uh, summed up very well. Uh, I believe the threat is real. I believe the threat is greater today than it was two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, though it existed then. And we have a way to counter the threat and to offer protection uh, to the men and women in uniform, and it's the fully FDA-approved anthrax vaccine. Now, certainly, uh, there are questions and concerns about the vaccine. Uh, there must be because it's not in widespread use. Although it is a very similar vaccine manufactured exactly the same way as tetanus uh, to a very similar organism, has very similar side effects, uh, people know about tetanus and are comfortable with it. By the way, before World War II, tetanus vaccine was also made mandatory for the armed forces, and during that entire conflict, there were only 12 cases of tetanus, despite all of the uh, ordinance that was around uh, the wounds suffered by uh, uh, the men and women in uniform. Uh, so this is not something that's particularly new. We know about this vaccine. You alluded earlier to the Gulf War, uh, and I think that's particularly pertinent because, as Dr. Bailey's described, uh, we've learned from the Gulf War. We learned that even though the vaccine is FDA approved, we needed to supplementally test it so that we knew it met the standards for, on top of the FDA approval, safety, sterility, purity, and potency. And we've done that testing on every lot of vaccine that's been administered to our soldiers. We knew that we had to have a way of tracking uh, the, uh, the administration of the vaccine and the individuals who received it uh, so that we could retrieve the data so that we knew when the next doses were, uh, were given. I returned on uh, Saturday from Seoul, Korea. While in Seoul, I received my fourth anthrax uh, vaccination, and uh, we checked. Today, I'm in that automated tracking system, uh, and so is the sailor who got it with me and the other soldiers uh, who happened to be there for their fourth shot in Korea. Uh, so we have that system. It works very well for all three services. And by the way, the sailor was getting his shot in an Army clinic, so it was entered through our system. It goes to the Defense Enrollment Eligibility System, uh, and when he goes on board his ship, the Navy will be able to uh, download that information and see when he needs his fifth uh, immunization, know what lot he got, and so forth and so on. Uh, so we're doing that very well. The independent review has already been mentioned. I'd like to uh, spend a moment on something that uh, I think we did very poorly uh, in the Gulf War and in following up on uh, uh, health issues, and that is risk communication, education, talking to people. Uh, we have tried to do this to the best of our ability and provide information. Uh, we have a goal in all of the services that no one gets a needle in their arm without having been educated, having been briefed, uh, often having the seen the leadership getting their immunizations first and having had the chance to uh, ask questions and get uh, pertinent and appropriate answers. Uh, so we've really taken that very seriously. And I'd like, if I might, to take two minutes and uh, show you a little film clip that has sure. to do with both the education effort, but I think that speaks to safety, and I'll conclude uh, with the safety. If I could have the film clip, please. <laughs> From the AFRTS News Center in Washington, this is the Two Minute Report. I'm Jim Langdon. On this edition, anthrax. Even a cute little guy like this could carry the deadly biological agent. That's why specialist Amber Stanley and the other people who handle animals at the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases have had anthrax vaccination shots. Specialist Stanley has worked at the Institute for more than two years. She took her first anthrax shot long before the vaccine became mandatory for all service members. I didn't mind it considering the biocontainment level we were in. Um, I figured at least it would give me a fighting chance if something had happened. Specialist Stanley says everyone she works with at the Institute has had anthrax vaccination shots. I haven't met anyone who's had any problems, any health problems, any health risks after taking the shots. Specialist Stanley has received six anthrax shots so far. John Condig probably can't recall when he took his sixth anthrax shot. He's been taking the vaccine here at the Institute for more than 30 years. 
I trust it completely. I have no questions about its safety whatsoever. But he says it's hard to talk about the vaccine safety to service members who have their minds set against the shots. I can understand their feeling, <clears throat> but, I, but I, my personal feeling is that I think they should take the shots as a safety precaution. And I don't believe there's anything, there's any danger involved in taking the shots. A tender arm is the only adverse reaction Mr. Kundig has ever had to anthrax shots. He still runs into people he worked with 30 years ago and says none of them have complained of side effects from the anthrax shots they took. That is the two-minute report from Washington. I'm You'd Jim uh, turn off the tape, please. Part of the education program, but it speaks to something else. Uh, he's one of the individuals who, since 1974, uh, having received anthrax, has been followed uh, for long-term health effects. And we followed those who received over 10,000 uh, of the immunizations, uh, over 1,000 individuals, uh, to see from 1974 to 1992 if, in fact, there were long-term health effects, and we found none. Uh, we've also done other studies in groups, for example, at Tripler Army Medical Center to see what the real uh, rate of even minor side effects. As Dr. Bailey's pointed out, we have those uh, that are significant side effects, but uh, somewhere, depending on the study, between 4% uh, and even as high as 30% uh, will have uh, minor local reactions. For example, on my second shot, uh, I developed a, uh, a nodule at the site of immunization. Uh, so there are those kinds of things. But in every study we've done, in every study that others have done, we have found the rate of adverse effects to be lower than those of other mandatory vaccines. Tetanus comes to mind, yellow fever, typhoid, uh, hepatitis A, hepatitis B. And of course, you know about the DPT that's mandated uh, by most states, in fact, by all states, uh, before students start uh, public school with far greater uh, adverse uh, reactions, or at least the rate of them. We believe this to be a safe vaccine. As far as efficacy, uh, you know that there's only been one human study, and uh, the numbers were in uh, approximately 1,000 uh, wool sorters. Uh, in the group that received the vaccine, none developed inhalation anthrax. In the group that did not receive the vaccine, four did. The numbers, while significant, uh, still aren't large enough to make uh, a great deal of conclusion. Though it was at least partially the basis for groups such as the National Academy of Pediatrics, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, and others to conclude that this was efficacious against inhalation anthrax. But we went further, of course, and did the animal studies that I think you're aware of. Uh, the guinea pig model is not a good one. It does not uh, uh, match our immune system or develop the disease as in humans. So we've used two models that do. Uh, one, the rabbit, two, the rhesus monkey. Uh, and in those studies, uh, which I can answer in greater detail, uh, we found the vaccine to be uh, protective uh, in almost all cases where all of the controls died. Uh, that concludes my remarks, and I'd be happy uh, after the others uh, speak to answer questions. Thank you, General Blank. Um, Surgeon General Fisher. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members. On behalf of Admiral Nelson, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to provide information on the safety and efficacy of the anthrax vaccination immunization program, AVIP. The department's decision to vaccinate all service personnel with the anthrax vaccine was made only after careful validation of the threat of weaponized anthrax and ensuring that the vaccine would provide safe and effective protection, which you've heard about. We also in the Navy have great confidence in the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine which has a long history, which you've just heard about again, of safe use with remarkably low incidence of side effects since its start in licensure by the FDA in 1970. I've received the vaccine, and its side effects with me are quite honestly less than what I experienced with the tetanus typhoid booster. Uh, so it's, you know that you got it, but my arm's fine. Our experience in the Navy has been very positive since we began the anthrax vaccine immunization program in May of 98. As of March 22, over 82,000 Navy and Marine Corps members have been vaccinated, with only eight reactions reported via the Vaccine Adverse Reporting System, the VAERS system. All have been returned to full duty. Our reporting policy requires a VAERS report be submitted when an individual is placed in quarters for longer than 24 hours, is hospitalized, 
or uh, suspected contamination of the vaccine lot is suspected. However, in our policy message, we emphasize that any adverse reaction can be reported and that anyone may submit a report, not just the provider. There may be additional individuals who have experienced some reaction to the vaccine that have not been reported. However, I'm confident that all of the serious reactions have been reported in our system. Also, Navy Medical Department personnel are instructed to provide sailors and Marines this informational brochure before they receive their first anthrax vaccine dose. This includes valuable information about the vaccine and answers to often asked questions, as well as giving the internet address for the Navy website on anthrax, which also then identifies other websites for information. Our main concern is the safety and welfare of our sailors and Marines. This is why we're protecting them against the threat of biological warfare by giving them the anthrax vaccine. We're fortunate to have a time-tested, safe, and effective vaccine to provide an important element of the body armor needed to defend our personnel against weaponized anthrax. Anthrax has now joined other immunizations received by our service member and servicemen and women to protect against disease threats just as important as wearing a gas mask or carrying a rifle when on the battlefield. Again, thank you for this opportunity to testify and I'd be happy to take specific questions. Thank you very much. Um, General Roman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I think that in my mind it is clear when it comes to pulmonary anthrax, there's one clear, simple truth. If you're not vaccinated, if you inhale the spores, you almost certainly will die. As the Air Force Surgeon General, it is my duty to protect the health of our airmen. This duty also requires me to be Air Force's point man in the war to combat diseases which are turned into weapons of mass destruction. Our greatest and prime biological enemy today is anthrax. And our strongest weapon against it is vaccination. Now, the Air Force so far has immunized about 65,000 people using 200,000 doses, and we have had uh, eight, uh, excuse me, uh, 12 total reports in the VIR system, uh, seven systemic, which is, of course, fever, uh, muscle aches, and uh, five local, which are uh, the local uh, induration and redness around uh, the immunization site. I personally have no doubts or concerns about the vaccine. As a physician, husband, and father, I wouldn't ask anybody to do anything I wouldn't do myself. I've completed my anthrax series, which is a series of six, and you would say, well, why are you at six and other people are at four? Uh, it looked like, uh, Mr. Chairman, a year, year prior to the decision, we were going to have the anthrax immunization uh, uh, approved, and I had started it, along with the then Chief of Staff, General Fogelman, started it uh, as, a, as an issue, once again, of uh, confidence and leadership. So I finished my, uh, my six, and I have no worries about its safety and, uh, and efficacy. The reason I'm convinced of that is that uh, the anthrax vaccine safety uh, is because the science and the tracking over a long period of time uh, is long-standing and credible. This is not a new experimental vaccine. As you pointed out, it's been FDA licensed for almost 30 years in both the civilian and military population. There has never been a question of its effectiveness and safety in its use. What is being questioned is people's perceptions simply because I believe this vaccine is relatively unfamiliar. It's unfamiliar because we have a generation of people who have forgotten about polio, diphtheria, tetanus, typhoid as major public health issues. And the reason that we've had the luxury of forgetting about those as public issues is because we have had vaccines to be able to, uh, to, uh, to deal with them. In short, I believe that this discussion is being framed incorrectly. It is being framed as fear of an immunization when I believe we have a weaponized agent a, that is uniformly lethal and we have an effective immunization 
And we shouldn't be framing this as fear of the immunization. We should be framing this as fear of the disease itself. Unfortunately, the anthrax vaccine has been getting unreasonable criticism in some circles. In particular, there are, in fact, uh, internet and email uh, uh, programs that I believe are not putting forth all the information that, uh, that is important. All those in, although their intentions may be good, I believe that these critics build fear unnecessarily about this vaccine. Yet it is interesting to note that little is said in the same publications about the devastating disease of anthrax, which, by the way, has the same mortality rate as the Ebola virus. And so we need to put it into context as we are talking about uh, the disease itself. Truly accurate information, and I believe, Mr. Chairman, you're correct, our obligation is for truly accurate information. I believe it will make it evident that it should be fear of the disease, not the immunization. Now, the Air Force, as an expeditionary Air Force, must be ready to deploy any time, and that means that in a moment's notice, our people must be able to get onto aircraft to execute our mission, and they must be fit and healthy. If our country is going to send us into harm's way, we must be equipped with every possible form of protection available. Losing life of even one person when it could be prevented is inexcusable. That's why it's mandatory for all service members to be vaccinated. In addition to the potential human cost, mass casualties would de degrade our military mission, military capability, and mission accomplishment. We would not send people into battle without helmets and weapons. So we should also provide the best armor against biological dangers that we can. That armor is immunization. We recognize that commanders, airmen, and family members must become, become informed about anthrax. We're working hard to educate them through our websites, internal media forum, and individual counseling. counseling. The Air Force has recently established an integrated process team run by the, uh, the assistant vice uh, of, uh, of the Air Force to ensure a comprehensive approach to the issue involving personnel from across the Air Force, that's medical, line, legal, public affairs, and others. It's been framed as a task force looking at the efficiency and effectiveness of the drug. That's, that's absolutely not what this is. It is looking at a large system with a large immunization program and saying, are our processes, are our messages, are they coming across consistently and clear? It is not a deviation by the Chief of Staff at all from believing that we're on the right track. It's an initiative in good management and strong leadership. I believe that the message of the IPT is clear. The threat is real. Anthrax kills. The vaccine will save your life. Thank you. Thank you, General. Um, let me ask the first question to you, Ms. B Dr. Bailey, and, and then any of you can respond to it. Why now? Why this program now? Why not five years ago? It's, we've known about it for 30 years. First of all, we did provide immunization to over 150,000 people in the Gulf uh, during the Gulf War. So this is not something that is new. Um, we also, as you have heard, have tracked immunizations for some time. This is a threat that has increased, and that is why now. Uh, let me um, pursue that question in a second. But uh, first, I'd like to, I realize I've been a little derelict in uh, letting you know who else is here. And uh, uh, we were joined uh, by um, uh, Congressman Biggert, uh, Judy Biggert from Illinois, and also um, Janice uh, Schakowsky from Illinois as well, um, and also the ranking member, uh, Mr. Blagojevich. And uh, I would uh, just uh, ask if Mr. Bogoyevich would like to make a statement, and then we'll get back into the questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Speaking of derelict, as the ranking member, member I was a half an hour late, I should confess to obvious dereliction. Um, I have a statement, and since I was late, rather than hold up the uh, testimony, I will submit this for the record. Thank you. And if I could, let me ask unanimous, do some housekeeping, ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place any opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose and without objection so ordered. And uh, I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statement in the record and without objection so ordered. And I would invite our other members if they would like to make a comment before we go back to questions. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, General Blank. Yes, I, I think there's a combination of factors. One is uh, the increased 
recognition or assessment of the uh, immediacy of the threat, uh, how serious it is, how likely it is to occur. Uh, but I also so think it, it has to do with how seriously we've taken it in the past. Uh, up until 1990, we faced the Soviet Union, uh, and ChemBio was almost in the too hard to do box. We knew that it was there. Uh, we didn't take it as seriously as now we do with the much more evident uh, threat nations, terrorist groups. Second reason is, given what I've just described, uh, it was only in uh, the, uh, the late 80s that we began a process to increase, through the Michigan Biologic Products Institute, the production of adequate amounts of vaccine so that we could immunize the whole force. And in fact, we did not have that amount uh, earlier, and it's one of the reasons that uh, we didn't do more immunization uh, in the Gulf in 1990. Uh, and so as all of these concerns were discussed and so forth, uh, we came out with the uh, uh, plan that you've heard described uh, in the, uh, the timing that you know. There, yes, sir, there, there are, as you know, uh, 10 nations that, uh, that we believe or suspect have, the, have this capability. Uh, and I believe there is an increased uh, recognition of the threat, particularly as we uh, as we look at an asymmetric uh, type of uh, of threat in the, in the new world. As you know, uh, the Ayum Shirikyo uh, experimented with uh, with anthrax prior to using sarin in the Tokyo uh, subways. Uh, about nine months ago, there was a threat in Las Vegas uh, of an individual to sell uh, anthrax. It uh, didn't turn out to be uh, be correct. Uh, about a year ago, B'nai B'rith here in Washington, D.C., received a package stating that it was, uh, in fact, anthrax. And there's been a flurry of envelopes going to, uh, to uh, women's clinics uh, uh, across the country. Uh, I think that, uh, that as you look at both uh, nation states and, uh, and as Ron uh, Blank talked about, uh, terrorist groups, uh, most of us that look at this uh, consider it not a question of whether but when. Uh, we're exposed to uh, to this uh, this agent, and I believe that uh, that it, it is therefore our responsibility, particularly as the threat increases, to uh, provide maximum force protection. Uh, let me just pursue the, the question. You, you used 100, 150 of our our um, of our soldiers, our sailors too, uh, and and airmen as well. It was a mixture. Who got the received the 150 who are the 150,000 who received this vaccine generally these were the uh, rear troops uh, those in ports airfields uh, they were not the front line because uh, this will not deter an immediate attack because it takes uh, two or three days uh, to begin working when uh, symptoms appear so this is the kind of agent that we felt would be used uh, to cripple the rear, potentially, and so those were the, uh, the uh, uh, troops that we tended to immunize. Uh, the, the decision was made in uh, CENTCOM by General Schwarzkopf and his staff. Um, you're saying that the impact uh, isn't felt immediately, it's felt in a few days? Yeah. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, may I, may I yes. just address that? Because sure. I think we need, to, we, need to, uh, we need to paint the picture correctly. The initial symptoms of uh, pulmonary anthrax or flu-like syndrome, where you have a cough, you have uh, muscle aches, and, uh, and, and, and low-grade fever. And, and as you would look at a, an individual, you would say you have the, flu, uh, have the flu unless you suspected that they were exposed to, uh, to anthrax. The difference between that and the flu is that three days later, they would be dead. And as a matter of fact, as you look at the accidental release in Sverdlovsk in, uh, in the then Soviet Union, uh, downwind, there were, uh, uh, we, th we think, uh, up to 100 people downwind who were, uh, who were exposed to a very small release of anthrax. And the, if, if you read the reports, the physicians in the emergency rooms, in the civilian emergency rooms, started talking among each other, saying, are you seeing a lot of flus? And they're saying, well, yeah, we're seeing more fluid. But then the follow-on question, and are your patients dying? And the fact of the matter is that once people develop symptoms to this, antibiotic treatment in the animal models has been ineffective, ineffective.
and that the mortality rate is as we as we describe it. So, so it's important to recognize that this is a this is a public health. It is a military uh, mission capability issue. Isn't it your testimony though? You need six shots. You need you need six shots as uh, as required by the FDA uh, for uh, for the immun for the immunization. Uh, Ron, I think you see after three, you see about 95 percent uh, uh, immunization, but it is still given by the FDA protocol. Well, uh, do you, uh, that's 95 percent established by whom? By the uh, antibody, uh, demonstrable antibody levels uh, will occur that we believe offers protection, certainly it does in animal models, uh, actually uh, in a uh, high percentage after just two shots, uh, 95 percent uh, of patients will demonstrate this antibody response and, and, after three. And how much time do you have to wait from one shot to the next to the next? The protocol is zero, two, and four weeks for the first three shots, so a month. Yeah. Now, we're, is that what we're doing right now? We are doing that, and then the fourth shot is at six months, fifth is at 12 months, sixth is at 18 months, and then there are yearly boosters. Again, this is the protocol established by the FDA on the basis of those earlier trials. Now, we determined that this would be Army personnel in, uh, uh, that weren't uh, forward engaged. Was this Air Force, Army, Navy? All, all services. Were the 150? No. Uh, That's 100. correct. So, now, um, why is it, uh, why, are, why aren't you able to tell us who those 150 people, are, 1,000 people are? because their, the record of their immunization was entered into their medical record rather than in an automated system that would allow, them to tr uh, allow us to track them individually. Now, we have, by unit, been able to determine uh, who has been there and, in fact, uh, who should have received the, uh, the immunization. And it was on the basis of that information that the uh, National Institutes of Health, Presidential Advisory Committee, Institute of Medicine, and so forth, did the studies that failed to show any correlation of golf-related health uh, problems with the administration of anthrax. That's what gives us uh, the information and the confidence uh, that anthrax was not a, uh, a cause of this uh, uh, these illnesses. I'm going to go to Mr. Blavojevich, but I, but but I, I'm I'm not clear to your answer. My understanding is that that uh, we have not taken this 150,000 and and seen uh, made a study exactly the impact on the 150,000. No, that's correct because we don't know individually who got it. What we've done is taken the uh, information from the comprehensive clinical evaluation program from the VA studies of those that are ill following their Gulf War service and uh, look to see if there were correlates uh, with the administration of the uh, anthrax vaccine. And it was based on two things. One was their own records or recollection of getting the anthrax vaccine first, and second, uh, on what unit they were in. Let me add, as far sure. as the tracking goes, that if you remember, there were four conditions that Secretary Cohen set. One of them was the tracking. That is one of the overwhelming successful aspects to this program. We can track down to the Social Security number whether or not you're two days late for your immunization. Let me just say, everybody sitting at this table is, uh, are the people responsible for this force health protection mission, and all of us have had our anthrax immunizations. Uh, that speaks to the safety Obviously, it's a leadership issue as well, but each of us can tell you that if you're a day late, uh, it is known by our system. We have uh, done a, a, an incredibly successful job of tracking every individual and therefore will have long-term capability to review retrospectively as well. Secretary Cohen told me he is under this program as well. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, Mr. Globovich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Bailey, if I can ask you a question or two. Um, the concerns that, you've, that have been raised about the extension of expiration dates on the vaccine, can you tell us whether the extension of expiration dates has had any effect at all on the safety or efficacy of the vaccine? I, I can. Go ahead. I want to give you some specifics, but go ahead, General Blank. Yes, General. That'd be great. Thank you. If, if I may, when biologic products are stored, whether they're anthrax vaccine or tetanus vaccine or hepatitis A vaccine, et cetera, they have, by FDA regulation, a three-year shelf life. At the end of that three years, the vaccine is again tested by the manufacturer generally, but with the FDA oversight to assure its potency. 
if the vaccine in this case or other biologic products uh, still meets their criteria, then it is certified for a further three years. We, in addition to the FDA doing that testing and uh, establishing a new shelf life, uh, did the supplemental testing uh, of the safety, sterility, purity, and potency, uh, separate, distinct, uh, actually more than the, uh, than the FDA requires uh, to be absolutely certain that there was no degradation in any way uh, of this product and that it was uh, entirely safe. Let me also add that uh, at no time have expired or contaminated lots or vials of vaccine been administered to our service member or shipped by any DOD, by the DOD to any military facilities. Uh, that's, that's the answer specifically you need to know, but I wanted to give you some other specifics, which is that there was a lot, number FAVO20, which was originally approved for release by the FDA in 1994. Uh, as General Blank indicates, expiration dates do come up. In fact, there was an expiration date on that of 1996. The manufacturer requested an extension of the expiration date, and they received an FDA ex ex expiration date extension until 1999, and that is a common practice. Okay, now these have been tested by lot, right? Not by individual vials, is that right? By lot. Can you explain why that is the case? That's standard manufacturing and production uh, well, yeah, plus it's tested before it's put in, uh, in vials. We store it by lot, in bulk. Okay. Um, let me have one, I have one more question. Uh, when Secretary Cohen announced the intention of the Department of Defense to go ahead with total force vaccination, he listed four elements as preconditions. Uh, why were these needed? That was to assure the safety and efficacy of the vaccine and that the program was in place in a way that uh, could be monitored. Specifically, uh, I, you were not in the room, but you, I know you know the four conditions, uh, supplemental testing and tracking and an implementation program and a communication program uh, to our service members. And uh, finally, uh, independent review. And all of that was accomplished so that Secretary Cohen could be comfortable that we moved ahead with the total force in the appropriate way. If I can add to that, though, uh, and I said it in my opening remarks, this has to do with two things. One are lessons that we've learned from the Gulf War. We're, we're not going to do that again and have that issue. Uh, I mean, I'm, all of us are bound and determined to do everything we can to prevent uh, what went on there, and that has to do with record keeping and supplemental testing and so forth. But, but it also has to do with credibility. It also has to do with some of the things that uh, the chairman mentioned as, as far as uh, atomic testing or Agent Orange or whatever it is uh, that I think has damaged uh, the credibility of the uh, department substantially. And so we had that independent review. We have the independent testing. We have the FDA uh, approval and so forth and so on, that automated tracking system. We need to make sure that the men and women in the armed forces uh, have that confidence that what they're getting is in fact uh, a necessity and, and will save their lives. Thank you very much. Ms. Bigger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this probably is for Dr. Bailey or uh, General Blank. Um, uh, you stated in your remarks uh, that there, there's only one producer of the vaccine. Uh, which has recently been acquired by somebody else, so it, but it still is one company. Are you comfortable with the fact that there is only one producer? I am comfortable at this time that the program that we have developed will provide safe and efficacious vaccine throughout the total force, which will take us uh, to the year 06, um, and will include uh, total force, active duty, and reserves. Yes, we will have safe, efficacious vaccine from that production facility. In general, I could, uh, I could share with you that I would like to see us um, less dependent on any specific production capability uh, manufacturing site with this vaccine or with any vaccine or any medication we may need for force health protection. Well, there's, um, and it, it was shut down for a while, renovation or an inspection violations? It was not shut down because of inspection violations. Uh, it was uh, for renovation and in fact uh, is now beginning uh, production again. Okay. Uh, does the Department of Defense have any... Could, could uh, the gentlelady just suspend for a second? W would you elaborate on that answer just a bit uh, as to the purpose for why it went through renovation? In, uh, has the facility not received 
um, critical review? While um, not manufacturing anthrax vaccine due to the renovation, a number of deficiencies with the process were cited. Now, FDA observes uh, and checks on all of the manufacturing sites of uh, medication that are provided right. uh, in uh, for um, our forces as well as other Americans. None of the deficiencies were considered significant enough to warrant plant closure or recall of the anthrax vaccine. In fact, the FDA also found that significant progress had been made toward meeting objectives under its strategic plan for improving its manufacturing facility and processes. While not required by the FDA, by the way, MBPI has performed supplemental testing, as General Blank indicated. Thank you. Uh, to continue then, uh, but weren't some of the lots actually uh, quarantined? I think 11 lots that were quarantined. Uh, with questions about uh, sterility and um, potency? Yeah. I'd like to give the specifics. Yeah, well. good idea. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, in some cases, the testing found that, in fact, they were fine and uh, were released by the FDA, uh, again, to go through our uh, supplemental testing to uh, doubly ensure everything. Uh, in uh, at least two cases of which I'm aware uh, we never did release them and uh, destroyed the lot. There was an additional uh, instance where we shipped vaccine to Germany, uh, 200,000 doses, and on the basis of one vial uh, having a little sludge in it, ice crystals, that is, uh, we feared that the uh, vaccine had been frozen, we destroyed all of them. We really are trying to bend over backwards to make sure that we have an absolutely 100 percent safe product. When you do further testing, is that and using it on animals, or is that the process that you would determine? Yes, it it, uh, it goes through. Uh, uh, of course, the sterility has to do with uh, cultures and the purity, with uh, chemical analysis. We know what's uh, in there, and then the uh, the safety and the potency on animal testing. How do you dispose of anthrax vaccine? <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know. Uh, I would imagine that one would uh, incinerate it. That's, that's the way you generally get rid of uh, biologics. Okay. I was just curious. Uh, <laughs> but the Department of Defense has no interest in the, in the company itself? No, I mean, there's no not. financial no. or... Anything. Let me just add, uh, again, we've got answers, but I want you to also have specific answers because we are very confident about this vaccine. Um, let me just back up a little bit and give you some details. During a routine, routine quality control inspection, and by the way, all the vials are checked uh, visually prior to shipment, the manufacturer detected the presence of a gasket or a stopper to the vial. Some of the material was in a number of the anthrax vials in a specific lot. All those vials in that lot that contained that material were discarded. Lots re lot release data on that particular lot was subsequent subsequently sent to FDA, and upon review, FDA did release the lot for use. So again, there's an inert material that had gotten into the material. It was not in the production or the safety of the vaccine or the sterility or purity or the efficacy that there was any concern. Uh, during the February 98 FDA inspection, and these are routine, they go on continually in vaccine production, the FDA, FDA requested they be provided documentation on destruction of the vials that contain the particulate matter. As a good manufacturing practice, the manufacturer quarantined all their remaining vials of that lot pending collection of the documentation required by the FDA. No recall of vaccine of that lot that had been shipped to DOD was instituted by the manufacturer, nor was it requested by the FDA, because all vials had been FDA approved before shipment and had been visu visually checked to ensure that none of those had any particular, any particulate material. Uh, just another follow-up on that. Are there any other companies that have expressed any interest in uh in the manufacture of anthrax? Well, in that there are, are no other interest in providing this vaccine except uh, as is the program that we've outlined here, um, there are not at this time. Uh, one other question then. How, uh, can, what is your judgment that, that this vaccine was, uh, will be effective if, 
if in case there is a you know a weapons uh, grade where it's it's needed rather than just because of, of being in a country that might have anthrax there. Well, again, we he, we have looked at the immunogenicity of the response, the antibody response to this vaccine, and it is very high. As you heard, uh, in fact, after your second immunization at just two weeks, uh, in that first month, you've got high antibody response, high immunogenicity. So it is very very effective. Uh, clearly, there have also been for years, as you hear, this has been FDA. Um, approved vaccine since uh, the 1970s, so we have almost 30 years uh, that show this to be a, an effective vaccine. In fact, there have been scientific studies that allowed the FDA to approve the vaccine, uh, starting back, as you've heard here, with the wool sorters uh, when this was a disease problem in the 1950s. And in fact, there have been uh, aerosol challenges, which is, of course, of great interest to us because that is how these spores would be weaponized. Those aerosol challenges uh, in rhesus monkeys show us that, in fact, it is overwhelmingly protective and that anthrax without the protection is incredibly deadly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, before recognizing um, my colleague from Illinois, uh, would, Ms. Dr. Bailey, would, are you, um, do you have in your possession the letter of March 11th that the FDA sent to the Michigan Biologic Products Institute? Um, um, the press release. Do you have it? I mean, are you I aware? Believe I do. I, I, I don't want to swallow camels and strain out gnats here, but um, the FDA issued a letter. I'm reading from their, from the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, which is the FDA's division. Uh, it has a headline: FDA warns Michigan Biologic Products Institute of intention to revoke licenses. And it says the, the FDA issued a letter to the Michigan Biologic Products Institute. Lansing, Michigan, on March 11, 1997, warning that the agency will initiate steps to revoke M MBPI's established and product licenses unless immediate action is taken to correct deficiencies at the firm. And then further on, it, it goes and says an FDA inspection of the MP uh, BI, uh, MBPI pr uh, conducted between November 18th uh, and 27th, 1996, documented numerous violations of the following areas organization and personnel, buildings and facilities, equipment control of components, drug product containers and closures, product production and process controls, laboratory controls and records and reports. Some examples are failure of the quality control unit to approve or reject all components, drug product containers, closures and in process materials, packaging material labeling and drug products, failure to have separate defined areas or other control systems for manufacturing and processing operations, failure to assure the equipment used in the manufacturing, processing, packaging holding of a drug product is appropriate design of adequate size for its intended use and for its clean, uh, cleaning and maintenance, failure to properly store and handle components in drug product containers and closures, failure to calibrate instruments, apparatus, gauges, and record devices at suitable intervals, and failure to record the performance of each step in manufacturing and distribution of products. That seems a little more significant than the way I had been led to feel based on your answer, Ms. Bigger. In fact, there were a number of deficiencies uh, with the manufacturing process that were cited. Could you move the mic a little closer to you and, and, and push it down a little because you're... In your fact, uh, there were a number of deficiencies uh, with the manufacturing process that were cited. In February 98, the FDA inspected the uh, facility, however, and none of the deficiencies were considered significant enough to warrant plant closure or, in particular, any recall of the anthrax vaccine. And in fact, the FDA also found that significant progress had been made toward meeting objective objectives under its strategic plan for improving the manufacturing facility and processes. I would also say that we are pleased to report that there has been a renovation of that plant and that many of these things have been taken into account. Well, that, that was the whole point. The whole point was, the implication was the plant was being renovated to deal with these problems and your implication to us was that you didn't need to make those renovations to take care of those problems. And the FDA did not require that there was that renovation. I know, I know they did. I, I'm just, I understand what you're saying. The, the, the renovation was planned long oh, yeah. before these problems uh, were, uh, uh, were brought to our attention. The 97 letter had to do with uh, production lines of vaccines other than anthrax. Right. They hadn't yeah. uh, looked at that, though the 98 inspection, while it acknowledged progress, uh, certainly did continue to find some problems with, uh, with the anthrax line, by which time we had shut it down, or Michigan had shut uh, it down. The, the record will show, Dr. Bailey, that your, your answer was accurate, that, I mean, uh, that we're not disputing the fact that there wasn't a recall and the plant wasn't asked to shut down. But I think the record will also show, uh, 
tremendous concern by the FDA. Revoking a license is not something that's uh, done lightly or suggested it will be done lightly. And, and uh, there were significant reasons. And I'm gathering your testimony is that you feel that this has been dealt with. Uh, I do, and I should also uh, state that JPO is going to testify later on Bioport specifically, and that um, I think you're, you can obtain greater information there as that is an acquisition and procurement uh, okay. uh, area, which is outside of, of my medical purview. Obviously, I have great concern, though, uh, about safety and efficacy and therefore uh, manufacturing processes. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, uh, Congressman Shuskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's really a, a pleasure to be on this committee and on the subcommittee, and thank you. I have um, a number of questions in other areas, but I want to follow up a little bit on this area of production. Is it true that the Department of Defense is paying for that renovation? Again, this is outside of the uh, affairs of, me of health affairs, and so I would uh, suggest that that more directly be related to JPO and questions referred there. I would be happy to take the question, however, for the record. Um, I'm looking at the brochures that were issued to service members and their families. And it, under the question, what if I am pregnant? This is to service members. Pregnant women should not receive this vaccine. If you are or believe that you may be pregnant, you should inform your health care provider. The vaccination program will be deferred until the pregnancy is complete. And then further, in the one that goes to families, it says there is also no scientific evidence to suggest that future pregnancies by service members or their spouses will be affected by the use of this vaccine. First of all, what was the basis for deciding that this was not a vaccine safe for pregnant women? Uh, there are no vaccines, to my knowledge, that are recommended to be given, um, or very few to be recommended to be given to women who are pregnant. It is generally a safety, um, a generalization uh, for women who are pregnant, although, again, there is no evidence at this time that there is any, uh, any concern uh, to the fetus of a pregnant woman. It is our policy, however, if anyone is pregnant or feels they may be pregnant, that they step out of line, that they acknowledge that, and that they, their uh, vaccine would be uh, therefore not given until the, uh, the completion of the pregnancy. And uh, General Rodman, do you want to? Well, I'm, I'm an obstetrician, so I, I, can, uh, I can talk to that. And that is we don't, we, I can verify, we do not give immunizations just on, on a basis of uh, common sense of not not exposing a fetus to anything uh, external, but there is no scientific uh, evidence to uh, to document damage to fetus by vaccines. We have had, if I may add, uh, several individuals who received the uh, vaccine at uh, our laboratories become pregnant uh, and have had no problems. Uh, this is not a vaccine, again, like tetanus, like any of the other vaccines, uh, which have similar uh, constraints on them uh, that that would cause uh, any problems during the pregnancy. The FDA uh, doesn't do testing of vaccines uh, during uh, pregnancy. So uh, as, again, a common sense measure, we recommend against giving it. Well, then in terms of long-term effects, have there been any tests on rhesus monkeys or otherwise on the potential long-term adverse effects of the vaccine? Saying, saying that there's no evidence that it is a problem is not quite the same as saying we have data to show that there is, in fact, no problem. We have um, a um, program underway now at Tripler um, in uh, Hawaii where we are looking at uh, a long-term study so that we will be able to uh, track the vaccine that we are given today. Uh, that will be a prospective study uh, to be accomplished over the upcoming years. Yeah, and we've specifically uh, tracked uh, the individuals since 1974 at our laboratory who have received the uh, over 10,000 uh, immunization doses of, uh, of the vaccine uh, and uh, as late as uh, 1992 have found uh, no long-term health effects. Plus, the uh, Michigan plant has since 1972 uh, distributed over 68,000 uh, doses of the vaccine uh, between uh, the, the early 70s uh, to uh, about 94. Uh, and uh, those have gone to uh, Centers for Disease Control, to uh, universities, uh, to veterinarians working with, uh, with the organism and so forth. Uh, if there are side effects or long-term health effects, it's reported to the FDA. They have no such reports. Uh, you mentioned the uh, 
CDC. Earlier, it was stated that should someone become ill from anthrax, that there really wasn't any um, antibiotic protocol that would address that. The CDC says um, doctors can prescribe effective antibiotics. Usually penicillin is preferred, but erythromycin, tetracycline, or another one that I can't pronounce, can also be used. To be effective, treatment should be initiated early. If left untreated, the disease can be fatal. So the, um, the CDC is saying that should someone contract anthrax, that it is treatable. Uh, in fact, I think that that is probably referring to cutaneous and not aerosolized anthrax. A weaponized, aerosolized anthrax, if you are unprotected without vaccine, you will die within 24 to 36 hours. Now, there are treatments that are undertaken if before you have symptoms. If you have symptoms of anthrax, and as you've heard here today, by the time we know we've been attacked, people are coming forward with flu-like symptoms. If you've got symptoms, you are going to die 99 out of 100 times, regardless of what treatment we would provide. I would also add that it is very difficult to determine exactly what it is that we're dealing with. In order to even know that it's anthrax, we have to do things like a chest x-ray, we have to do a gram stain on blood products. By that time, you can imagine if our troops are in fact in harm's way and have been attacked, that we have a major combat casualty situation on our hands. Now, we do treat. We will in fact treat those with Cipro, doxycycline, penicillin, uh, but what you are commenting on, I believe, is cutaneous anthrax, as reported by CDC. Um, do we have any non-compulsory vaccination programs? Are all of our um, programs in the armed services, they're, they're all mandatory. Are there lots of service members who are seeking to be excluded from this program? We are at this time not specifically tracking, although we are looking at a policy given our concern uh, about those who may refuse this particular vaccine. Um, however, that is uh, the refusal of a direct order, and that is something that is a command issue dealt with as a uh, line commander issue. At this point, it is our understanding that we have, after over 223,000 people have been immunized, less than 200 who have refused of the immunization. Is it, is it true that it, in um, Great Britain that it is not, in fact, that it's an optional program? That's true, but it is also true that there are ships at sea in the British Navy where no one is protected. So again, it is a concern of ours that this is a much higher threat than it has ever been before, and we do not want to see our sons and daughters going into harm's way unprotected. Let me ask one other question about this issue of protection. Um, other than the vaccine, are there other strategies, safeguards that are encouraged, clothing, masks, et cetera? My, my concern here is that is there any way in which this vaccination program could be somewhat counterproductive? That is, that will people who are vaccinated feel that they don't need to take other kinds of precautions? Let me just um, share with you that uh, four weeks ago, I was in the Persian Gulf, and uh, I was both on an uh, aircraft carrier at sea and in the desert with our troops. And I slept one night in a bunkered area. And uh, though sitting in the Pentagon, there are times where one would wonder why you may need anthrax immunization. It was no doubt in my mind that I was in harm's way. And that being responsible for all those around me, that I was pleased that we had a very robust uh, vaccine program there in the desert and anywhere else where it is where it is it is considered a high threat if i could add something because because i think you're hitting on a uh, very important point uh, and it has to do with other protective measures the uh, mop gear we have the the protective gear for chemical and biologic in fact does protect against uh, not only chemical but biologic uh, agents such as this the difficulty is that an enemy would probably use this before the start of hostilities. Uh, for example, as we were building up in the rear uh, areas and that kind of thing. And we wouldn't know it because we do not have real-time detectors. By the time we would know about this 
it would be far too late to put on those protective measures, and certainly this is not something uh, during a buildup that people would be uh, uh, using 24 hours a day. It's very difficult to work in and so forth and so on. So uh, would they, at a time of other threat, take uh, put on this, uh, this measure even though they had the vaccine? Absolutely. Why? Because of other biologic and certainly the chemical agents uh, for which the, uh, the suit is good protection. This, this is so deadly, not only because of the illness it causes, but because it can be dispersed, it can be spread, we can all be exposed without anybody knowing it until two or three days later, and then it's too late. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kubojevic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to get the, uh, the chronology set uh, straight if I possibly can. This, and this is a question for whoever wants to answer it. The Secretary announced the program in December of 1997 he included the four conditions to be met prior to going forward. You stated that he certified these conditions were met the following May of 1998. Is that right? Yes. But didn't you go ahead before May with the accelerated program for Southwest Asia? Yes. The, in in uh, Southwest Asia, there was a concern that the threat uh, had become so great that it was important to us for us to go ahead and immunize those who were early deployers into that area of high threat. Is there a, um, as I understand it, there is no uniform, consistent form of discipline for service members who refuse the vaccine. Uh, is that a fact? It's correct. It is a decision that is made service by service. Okay. What if any risk is, uh, let me rephrase that. Is there any risk that individual commanders may discipline differently and cause a disparity that uh, might foster uh, favoritism or in the alternative resentment? Uh, again, that is a line command issue, and I would uh, ask General, could you could the general address the surgeons that? to respond? Right. Okay. Well, as as uh, with with everything under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, it's it is the line commander, it is the commander on the ground that uh, that is in control of that. Uh, the the line commander is responsible to begin with education, uh, to get the information out to all of the troops. After that information is given, and if there is somebody that refuses, in, particularly in the Air Force, that we have medical counseling, and if it's a religious issue, uh, counseling by the clergy. If, if, if it is not a religious issue, then uh, a direct order is given to, uh, to get the immunization. And then, then there is a choice that the individual has about uh, whether to comply with a lawful order or whether to, uh, to enter the Uniform Code of Military Justice. This, this is in many ways a uh, uh, good order and discipline issue because in a military you can't decide which order you're going to obey and which order you're not going to obey. It just doesn't work that way. And, the, and, and I have been asked the question, well, well, wouldn't a civilian have a choice of doing that? And the answer is, of course, a civilian would have a choice of doing it. That's what differentiates us from a civilian organization. And the fact of the matter is that we put our people in harm's way and they don't have a choice of where they go and therefore we need to protect them. That's why the local commander is in charge of that because he's responsible for the protection of the troops as well as the military mission. I don't believe that, uh, that as we look at the Uniform Code of Military Justice that there's an issue of, uh, of, of favoritism. Uh, I can't talk about the resentment issue because uh, anytime you're in trouble, you have a tendency to resent that. And that's very similar, the same situation in the Navy in regards to the commanding officer on board the ship, the commander of Marines, they have the responsibility for their troops and the authority and responsibility rests in that individual. So whether there's favoritism or not, I have no idea, but I know that the leadership takes this issue very seriously and acts accordingly. General Kerwin, when he retired as the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army many years ago, gave a speech that stuck in my mind and it said, it's very interesting that to protect the rights of those in this society, we who wear the uniform give up certain of our rights. It's, it's a term of employment that in fact you follow lawful orders. Uh, and you can't choose which orders to follow, uh, as General Rodman said. So this really is not, in, in that sense, a uh, medical issue. It really is uh, a command issue, a good order and discipline issue. And in my view, 
uh, those that choose not to follow the order uh, have broken uh, their term of employment and should be separated from service. Now, with what degree of punishment, uh, that's up to the line commander. Uh, but I believe uh, then, then they should be where they can make choices, and that's as civilians. Okay, one final question. The, um, what do you think are the biggest challenges that Department of Defense faces in implementing this vaccination program? I think always uh, there is a concern um, about perception. And as you've heard here today, this is a safe vaccine that provides us the very best way of protecting our troops when they are in harm's way. I would be very concerned if the perception and these low numbers of uh, refusals you, that you hear in an overwhelmingly successful program that is being tracked um, uh, at the highest possible level to the the most minute detail that in some way this program would be adversely affected because it provides us such safety as we attempt to uh, provide the absolute best force health protection available. Thank you. Before we go to our next panel, I'd like to get a few um, answers on the record and um, have a dialogue about a few areas of this that we've already discussed. Um, as a doctor, um, Dr. Bailey, what concerns do you have about the health effects of multiple vaccines administered at the same time? Uh, we have administered multiple vaccines. I have taken multiple vaccines. Um, it is part of my job to institute policy and, and provide uh, ongoing um, health protection that often includes providing multiple vaccines. And at this time, I have no concerns about the vaccines that have been provided or that we are planning to provide for those who deploy. Do you, um, so, so you don't take much, um, give much credibility to studies that, that uh, talk about the cocktail effect of various vaccines? I have been seen nothing at this time. Now, if you're asking, am I concerned, uh, everyone about as well, I think, uh, at this table was involved, uh, as, uh, as you've heard, when we went through the issues that dealt with uh, the medications, pretreatments, and uh, protective uh, medicine that was done during the Gulf War. We are very concerned uh, that we understand exactly what happens to our troops in theater so that we can assure ourselves that, in fact, there are no long-term health risk effects for any of the treatments that we provide to protect our troops. Uh, so uh, am I not concerned at all? I am certainly concerned about those who may be sick who have deployed with the United States military uh, and would want to follow that and have a better ability to track. I am confident that this program you are hearing about today provides us again with a new standard for allowing us to track that in the future so that we can be absolutely certain from a scientific point of view that we do not have a cocktail effect which, it, which could adversely affect someone's long-term health. How many biological and chemical agents are out there that we have concern about? Well, the actual list is uh, a classified list, um, but uh, clearly... Um, What's there, been printed but, in the newspaper? But I will, I will share with you a list um, that, um, is the one, uh, that includes some of the things that you've heard about. And uh, so, again, I think us setting the standard here with anthrax um, is uh, probably one of the most essential aspects of the program you're hearing about today. Uh, clearly... Um, no, Ma'am, I just want an answer. Anthrax, doctor. plague, smallpox, botox, ricin. And there are variations, right? I mean, there are, there are different kinds of anthrax. Is there variations to them? Uh, there well, uh, there are variations to some. Uh, clearly, smallpox, there are a variety of different what we call orthopoxes. Plague, you can have bubonic plague or pneumonic plague. Um, doesn't the Defense Department list a whole host of, of um, this, uh, biological toxin warfare agents, isn't there a lot more than what you've mentioned? Yes, but I'm being very careful to mention those that are specifically not on any lists that I may be aware of that are classified, Is but certainly classified? there are a long list of, of biologic agents on the piece of paper that you have in front of you, and by the way, in the world today, which concern me greatly, which are biologic agents that could be weaponized. You know, I, I just want to know the truth. Um, you are expressing your concerns. But I also, I want there to be some candor between us. When I don't see that candor, I begin to suspect. I mean, this is a list with a whole number of threats to our soldiers. And this isn't classified. Um, and it's a list that includes probably 50. Uh, sir, and I don't know exactly what you have on your list. Um, but I would say, of course, there are concerns. But what we are focused on 
are the assessment of threat risk in a specific area where we may have deployed troops. Those are the assessments we make on a regular basis so that we can determine what kind of protection we need to provide against those particular illnesses or disease processes. The trouble I'm having communicating right now is that we are both aware of a classified list. And the classified list includes more than what you have. And we're also aware of, of and I'll, as soon as we make a Xerox copy, we'll go through some of that. But it's more than just a few. Yes, and, I agree. Uh, and, and, and they, you talk about anthrax as killing you in three days. Some of what's on that list would kill you in less than a day. And it makes me wonder, um, I don't need to be convinced that anthrax will kill. <clears throat> Um, but I also know there's a whole host of others that will kill. Yes, sir, but uh, I will take a look at this list, but let me just say that we know Saddam Hussein had vats and production capability and plan for implementation of anthrax as a weapon. And we it also know he had others. Yes. Yes, right. That's that correct. we're not protecting and that a vaccine won't protect. And we know... And, and so I'm just making the point to you that it... Once we've made the point that anthrax can kill, I concede that it will kill. And I also concede the fact that if I was ordered to take it, I would probably take it if I was a soldier. Uh, I don't concede the fact that you have to, to uh, and I need to be convinced of the fact, uh, I would like to be convinced of the fact that this has to be in order and that you can't have 200 people who might decide not to take it and that, that I wonder what you know, what harm is done in that instance. Um, and, and so that's another area to, to talk about. But first, just this issue. You are protecting against one deadly substance, one biological agent. There are others. Yes, sir. And when we had permitostigmine bromide, PB, as I'm easier for me to talk about, and we ordered every one of our troops to take what was in effect for the use it was used, experimental, uh, and we had a requirement from the FDA in order for you to use it in this experimental way that the records be kept and they weren't. Yeah, there is credibility here and I'm happy to know you're taking record keeping. But there is concern among scientists who have respect in their professions that there was a cocktail effect. And you are telling me that, you know, you've taken <coughs> this agent and, you, and, and therefore you're comfortable. That's, you know, somewhat interesting, but, but it doesn't answer the question. There are people who are concerned about the cocktail effect. It causes me concern that you're not concerned. Um, Dr. Well, Blank? Mr. Chairman, yeah, sorry. Yes. I, I, I don't mean to leave the impression I'm not concerned. Uh, I clearly would be concerned about any effect, which is why I'm so pleased that we are beginning to track immunizations, which as you understand, we did not, uh, we were not afforded the, uh, the ability to do so. Uh, during the Gulf War. So, yes, in fact, I'm very concerned that there could be any effect from any of the medical pretreatments or interventions that we provide uh, and that it could, in fact, affect adversely someone's long-term health. Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, add briefly, uh, I'm aware of at least four studies, uh, most recent of which was uh, published in the Annals of Internal Medicine that has looked at uh, several thousand travelers who have received uh, multiple vaccinations, cocktails, if you will, and has not found any long-term health effects. Plus, uh, we follow our workers, uh, as I described, not only for anthrax, but uh, for exactly that effect, uh, because uh, many of our laboratory workers uh, receive not only the um, uh, FDA-approved vaccines, uh, as our soldiers do, but also uh, the experimental vaccines that we're in the process of working on so that we can uh, have some protection for some of these other agents. Uh, and we have found in, uh, in those workers, again, no long-term health effects. Uh, and, and they're fairly substantial numbers, uh, certainly not in the hundreds of thousands, but uh, more than five or ten. In, uh, so we are concerned. In, lastly, uh, I think your point about other agents uh, is exactly right on. Um, anthrax is probably the, the easiest to use, and as you go down the list, uh, you find them more difficult uh, to use, more limited in their use. It's not to say they wouldn't be used. Uh, so it is incumbent on us uh, to develop uh, other uh, additional vaccines, other protective measures, detectors, and so forth. Um, thank you. Um, let me just conclude this part and go, and then I'll go to the next line of questioning. Um, 
is there any, uh, are, are we concerned that, that we have been, that some of our adversaries have been able to alter anthrax and that uh, the vaccine that we have taken, that we are requiring our troops to take would be uh, not protect them? Uh, we have no evidence <clears throat> at this time of uh, there having been any genetic alteration that would affect the efficaciousness of the anthrax vaccine. Uh, clearly, that would have to be a concern that that could be done as we move ahead in a, in a complex world where there is much going on in terms of uh, DNA and, and altercations of DNA. Um, I, I am pleased to report, however, that there is also no evidence that antibiotic resistant strains are not responsive to our vaccine as well. So again, we feel comfortable the vaccine we're providing will uh, assure safety. Okay. It's been, I'm sorry, doctor. Well, the Russians have uh, reported that they were able to alter anthrax by genetically engineering it uh, in a way that uh, actually made their vaccine different than ours ineffective. And isn't it true that some of their soldiers were uh, affected by this themselves? Didn't they have some casualties themselves? Well, that was from the, the natural uh, anthrax strain that uh, they were working on and that, uh, uh, that was released that General Rodman alluded to. Uh, and there were 100, I don't know, plus uh, or minus. Do we know that was a natural strain or not? We do. That was a natural strain. It was not a genetically engineered strain. Now, the genetically engineered strain not only uh, was, was engineered, but it changed its fundamental characteristics and made it unstable. Uh, they were never, we are told, we believe, uh, got it out of the test tube. They were not able to do the things with it that you would need to uh, to weaponize it. Now, we have been trying and trying to uh, uh, get some of what they claim they have, but it's only reports uh, to see if our vaccine is effective. Uh, I would simply say that our vaccine is effective against drug resistance, against all natural strains. Uh, whether it would be against such uh, an altered uh, organism, I can't say. Okay. I, I would just conclude and express the concern that that this committee will look at, and that is that the list is quite significant. Uh, we're, we're basically uh, having a force protection on one anthrax when there are so many others, and it would strike me that, that our adversaries will just choose another substance. And, um, uh, and then we have now, in, instead of going the direction the French have gone, which is basically dealing their force protection with protective gear, that I believe is superior to ours, um, and learning how to use it and perfect it so that they can be protected against a whole variety of, of agents. And it's just a, a concern I have. I'm pleased that we're keeping better records, however. Mr. Yes. Chairman, can, can I, uh, I, I've reviewed this list, and, uh, and clearly it is a compendium of bacteria sure. and virus. Uh, I mean, it's a textbook of, of microbiology. In fact, we do protect against a number of these. And as you look at this uh, and, and you, uh, uh, you look at salmonella typhi, typhoid, we give immunizations to that. Uh, Vibrio cholera, we give immunizations to that. But mu much of this has to do with the public health issues and, and, and the sanitation of our force and, and it's important to be able to put these into, into context, and many of these are not stable as anthrax. Now, anthrax is a particularly interesting micro, uh, microorganism because it develops spores when it's not in an environment that's conducive to, uh, to life. And those spores can live for 40 years in the soil. I think, uh, as you know, there's, a, uh, there's an island north of the UK that, uh, that was contaminated prior to World War II. The, the whole point of that is that, that anthrax is particularly different from any of these in that it can be laid down uh, by aircraft, it can be put into uh, an aerosolizer like a fogger, and will remain suspended and therefore be aerosolized and not, uh, not be unstable. So I think you're, you're correct. There's a whole list of these, and there are public health responses. There are also immunizations that we do give. But, but you can't look at anthrax and say, well, that's the same as uh, Clostridium perfringens or, or Vibrio cholera, because they are different organisms. We believe that anthrax is, in fact, the primary threat that we have. Uh, we know that it was weaponized. We were fortunately not exposed to it. It is weaponizable. 
It is lethal. We have an immunization for it. Thank you, General. That's helpful. Uh, does any, do any of my other colleagues have questions? Yeah. Ms. Bigger. Thank you. Um, what if someone, uh, there are people that have in the services that have refused um, the vaccine. What about in the case of, uh, you know, a religious reason or, uh, you know, that they don't take any drugs at all for, um, because of, of their religion? Is there a discipline for that or is it just? No, there's not. It's not a disciplinary issue for religious reasons. There are several reasons why you are uh, permitted to be excluded. Uh, if you're running a high fever, if you're pregnant, if there are religious reasons. But outside of that, it is a lawful order. It, would, there, would that be a reason for a transfer from some areas that might be, uh, uh, you know, they might be at risk? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then my other question is, as far as multiple vaccines, uh, do we keep records on, you know, having this, this vaccine at the same time that, that other vaccines are given? I, maybe that's been asked. I don't know if that's... Mm, I happen to have around my neck, because I believe uh, <laughs> you got yours as well, the uh, personal information carrier. You know, we've been doing uh, military medicine in many ways in terms of our tracking. Um, the same for uh, through a lot of different wars and deployments. We need to change things. We need to develop this personal information carrier, which is smaller than a dog tag, and which would let us know what the health concerns were before deployment, during deployment, what occurred during a deployment, and then post-deployment and long-term. And that's the information technology that we are seeking and actively involved in and hope to have very soon. Great. Thank you very much. This, by the way, has my immunizations on it. Uh, we will begin uh, uh, testing this at Fort Bragg and presumably Bosnia later this year. Uh, it, it also has uh, a uh, ultrasound of a uh, fetus in utero, which I assure you is not mine. But, but the point is that it uh, carries an enormous amount of information. It's a 20 megabyte chip. Thank you very much. Thank it, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Is it the intention of the DOD to integrate this with the VA? Because right now... Absolutely. Kind of Absolutely. Nervous. I, thank you very much. I found uh, this panel very helpful and informative, and thank you very much. Let me, uh, I should have asked one thing. Is there anything that any of you would like to say before leaving? I, sh I always like to give that option. Is there any, any comment that any of you We would appreciate like? the meaningful exchange, and I would also share with you, we absolutely appreciate the concerns that you share with us that we share as well. Uh, all of us look for the same end, um, providing for the defense of this nation, but also defending those who do so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I just make a request that, that some on your staff stay for the next, next panel uh, and be able to respond to that in writing if there's a need to? Sure. Not that you all need to, but someone stay. Thank you very much. Our second and last panel is uh, we have testimony from six uh, witnesses, and we welcome them. Captain Thomas L. Remfer, Connecticut Air National Guard. Major Russell E. Dingle, Connecticut Air National Guard. Private First Class Stephen M. Lundbaum, United States Marine Corps. Mr. Mark Zaid, Attorney at S. Zaid, Attorney at Law. Colonel Redmond Handy, Member Reserve Officer Association. And Ms. Lorraine K. Greenleaf, uh, Denver, Colorado. Representative your son. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I invite our witnesses. Uh, we need uh, 12, uh, six uh, chairs. I think we need one more chair there.
we're going to slide those chairs down a little bit, I think, this way. Mr. Dingle, I'm going to ask you to slide down a little further. Mr. Dingle, if you'd slide down just a little further. Thank you. And, and we're going to ask you to take your name with you. Right up there. If you'd slide your name. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> Ms. Greenleaf, do you have enough space there? Do we need to move down a little? Um, Mr. Lumbaum, can you move down just a speck that way? I thank you. We, we're able to fit. Uh, we're all right, Mr. Remper. If you could slide down, Mr. Zade, a little bit more. And we can get everybody in. Thank you. Okay. We all set? Um, if, I, if I could, I'd ask you to all stand and we'll administer the oath. Thank you. <laughs> Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony we'll give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go in the order. I'm going to put on the clock, uh, uh, and it's going to be five minutes. I'll let you run over a little bit, but if we can stay close to that, it would be appreciated. Uh, but frankly, your testimony is probably more helpful than the questions we would ask. So um, we're happy to hear you, your testimony, and we're delighted to have you here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Remford, uh, we're going to start with you. Thank you, sir. Good morning. I want to begin by thanking Congress for all you do to ensure America has the best trained, equipped, and protected military in the world. And I thank the members of this committee for your willingness to thoroughly review the anthrax vaccine immunization program. Given the rapid rate at which the costly program is progressing, I believe timely action by Congress is absolutely critical to ensuring that the vaccination policy is truly in the best interests of force protection. There is an important common bond behind why we are all present today, and it's because we all care about our armed forces. We simply disagree on what form of force protection is best for our troops. Do we achieve it through mandatory vaccines or through other means? I believe the answer to this question is important because service members are making serious choices about their military careers as a result. Out of respect for the military, and my chain of command, I am not here today in uniform. My professional dissent on this policy brings me to Congress only after attempting to resolve this issue and my concerns through my chain of command. I believe it is my duty to speak out against the dangerous doctrinal precedents and the questionable effectiveness presented by the anthrax policy. We are not speaking out against a vaccine or public health issues. We take a lot of shots. We've always take, taken them. We're speaking out against vaccines, against biological weapons. As an officer in the Air Force, I've obeyed orders for nearly 16 years while serving as a fighter pilot in Korea, Central America, Bosnia, and the Middle East. That's what makes my duty today particularly difficult. Yet from my earliest training at the Air Force Academy, I have also been trained to question orders if they are objectionable. I learned this from officers who lived through the challenges and learned from the lessons of the Vietnam War. Today, it is not the legitimacy of this order that I question or the officers that are enforcing this Department of Defense directive. Instead, I'm questioning the assumptions on which the policy is based and feel that by implying our troops are protected against anthrax, we may actually place them in more danger. The Defense Department acknowledges they did not anticipate a resistance to this program. The resistance is partly based on our self-education process and what we've discovered is a cursory nature of the review that occurred prior to the implementation of the program. Therefore, I hope this recognition warrants a congressionally directed comprehensive review that also answers the following questions. Number one, what suddenly mandates the use of this outdated vaccine? Both the capability to weaponize anthrax and the FDA approval for the vaccine have existed for decades. The troops are asking, as you have asked today, why now? Why force us to take a vaccine that was not intended to combat the inhalation exposure to anthrax and that will be defeated by using different or mutated strains or simply a different pathogen altogether? The body armor that our Department of Defense panel refers to 
is perceived by many service members as tinfoil armor. Why abandon the time-tested deterrence doctrine of massive retaliation that was successful in the Gulf War by mandating a force protection measure that may create a facade of force protection, possibly endangering our soldiers? <laughs> Finally, could it be dangerous to erroneously imply to our top military and civilian leaders that our soldiers can withstand a biological attack through defensive posturing? Why have we prudently avoided this path for the preceding decades? Perhaps it's because we can't defend against the dynamic nature of this warfare. After answering these questions, I will believe you con will conclude we can do better than an outdated, marginally effective vaccine that targets only one of many potential biological threats. Instead, I hope Congress will mandate a program that offers real comprehensive force protection based on logical foundations of intelligence, detection, external protection, and medical treatment. These foundations of force protection rely on a credible willingness to use force. This resolve won the Cold War and it won the Gulf War. Abandoning this time-tested doctrine and emphasizing the inevitability of biological attack in policy may inadvertently result in legitimizing biological warfare. A monument in Washington, D.C. honors America's soldiers by saying, first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of our countrymen. Just as that quote impressed me, I am equally encouraged by this committee's decision to keep your service members' interests first by reviewing this program. The dialogue you've initiated today could perform a vital service to this nation by halting a potentially dangerous doctrinal shift. You can help ensure our armed forces' readiness by stopping personnel losses. You can also help ensure that the armed forces remain an attractive service option for young Americans. It is my ardent hope that this policy will be reviewed and that mandatory inoculations will be discontinued. This review may find that the cost of the anthrax vaccination policy far outweigh its limited force protection benefits. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Remper. Uh, Mr. Tingle. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking, and, and while the, the other gentleman... Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Dingle. I'm sorry, we're going to use that mic. And, and, don't, and let me just say something to you. We're, we're doing five minutes, but uh, don't, don't, don't feel you have to rush. You can take your time, and if you go over five minutes, we can deal with that. Thank you for that, sir. Uh, it's interesting to, to listen to the, uh, the first panel talk, and, and during that short time, I wrote four pages of one-line notes that... Uh, I would love to address with corrections and follow-on questions, but I'll read my opening statement first. Thank you once again for allowing us and myself to appear today. Mr. I'm Nico, let me just say that you'll have an opportunity to go through that so you can have a peace Thank of you. mind about that. And let me just say to all the witnesses, it's not easy to come and testify before Congress, and I think it's particularly difficult uh, when you serve in the government and, and are testifying. And I, and I know that um, um, your superiors recognize that you're, you're doing this in the proper way, and, um, and that uh, we all respect it. And so we know it, it's discomforting to you, but uh, I'd like you to feel as at ease as possible because you are welcome here. The committee invited you. We want you here, and the military understands that you're here at our request. Thank you for those words of encouragement. Uh, we are, in fact, uh, I, well, I can speak for myself, uh, very apprehensive this morning, but after uh, listening to the first panel, we are encouraged that we have, are, have been given the opportunity to speak. I'm a guardsman, a citizen soldier, a major, and a former flight commander in the Connecticut Air National Guard. I've just completed my 10th year flying A-10s for Connecticut and 17 total years in the service. I will not see an 11th year in Connecticut flying the A-10. I have declined the opportunity to receive the anthrax vaccine and am resigning. Last September, my unit announced an anthrax vaccination policy that many officers objected to. In response, the wing commander delayed the shot schedule and formed a team to research the vaccine. I was a key member of that team. In little more than a week, the information I gathered presented a compelling argument against the DOD claims of safety and effectiveness. The team presented 15 questions to the commander on October 14th. He forwarded these questions to his superiors. By the end of October, and with no answers, answers forthcoming, we were told the anthrax conversation was over and that the shots would commence as scheduled. 
Connecticut began the anthrax vaccination program on November 7th. Our lot was using lot FAV030, a lot specifically identified by the FDA as being contaminated in their 1998 inspection report of the Michigan production facility. <clears throat> it became apparent that our use of the chain of command to affect a difference was not working. We felt that public involvement was our last opportunity to get this program reviewed and perhaps halted. I've been a reluctant participant in this ongoing tragedy, but as a guardsman, I'm in a unique position. I have the option to resign when I don't agree with an order. While it would be easy to just walk away and leave this mess for others to deal with, I cannot in good conscience allow this program to go unchallenged. I am here today to try to highlight the fallacies of the DOD claims of safety and efficacy, and to highlight the uncertainty that traditional guardsmen and reservists face. The questions we have raised have been distributed to our commander, the news media, all of you, and others. Have our military leaders sought to answer these questions? Have they prepared canned answers just in case you ask them? While I cannot begin to argue the complex medical issues with these medical experts, <clears throat> the literature available contains clear, unambiguous statements that don't agree with the DOD position. For instance, the vaccine has been FDA approved and licensed since 1970 why did a former Fort Detrick commander define the vaccine as experimental in a 1990 article? The vaccine is absolutely safe and effective. Why did another Fort Detrick commander conclude that the vaccine was unsatisfactory in a 1994 edition of the medical textbook vaccines? The vaccine is so widely used, why isn't it in the latest physician's desk reference? The DOD relies on a 1994 American Academy of Pediatrics report that the vaccine is effective against inhaled anthrax. Yet the 1997 report by this academy dropped that statement. While it appears that the DOD is devoting vast amounts of time, money, and manpower educating its members about how safe this program is, it is falling short in some key areas. Why isn't the DOD telling members of the military what side effects to be aware of or report? Why are they discounting those who do, not report, who do report side effects and not report those side effects to higher headquarters? <clears throat> Why isn't the VIRS form available or made known to members? As citizens sold... What was the last point you said? Why what? Excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry. I said, uh, why isn't the VIRS form available or made known to members? As citizen soldiers, we all face the uncertainty of medical care should our health be affected while in some sort of military status. We may be soldiers on the weekend, but when Monday rolls around, we are civilians. What happens when our guardsman reacts to this vaccine on Tuesday or next week? or when after two years, uh, two years after she retires? Will the state be forced to pay the medical care of affected unit members? Will their civilian insurance companies pick up the tab? Or will the federal government pay? Will the, feder will the member face a revolving door of denials and blame games between the VA, the state, and the insurance companies? A threat to our personal health, perceived or real, is a critical factor in whether or not we choose to volunteer our bodies in service to our country. How will this threat affect my civilian job? Should I risk both my military career and my civilian career? These are real and serious questions that many volunteers are asking themselves. The threat and uncertainty of care needs to be addressed. <clears throat> and finally, the number of games the DOD plays needs to be challenged. There does not seem to be one set of numbers the DOD is using for public relations. One spokesman says they don't know how many shots were given in Desert Storm. The next has an exact number, including an exact number of adverse reactions. Another DOD spokesman reports one number of pilots resigning, and having first-hand knowledge, I know that number is incorrect. The lack of consistent data is troublesome. The research and literature is out there. It was performed and written by experts in the field. There can be little doubt that it was accurate when, it was, when accomplished. If the DOD refutes or interprets these data differently to defend their position, perhaps it is time then to allocate funds to the DOD, perform a proper study of this vaccine in the interest of providing the pr best protection to our forces. This controversy is not about the Connecticut Guard, the people seated with me, or myself. It, it is about what is right, not who is right, and this is wrong. I urge the committee to ask the tough questions, to demand forthright answers based on documented evidence, to hold the military accountable for its actions and decisions that affect the health of all of its members, including its citizen soldiers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tingle. Mr. Lumbaum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee, uh, good morning. 
My name is Stephen Lombaum. Um, I'm originally from Livermore, California. I'm currently serving as a private first class in the United States Marine Corps at 29 Palms, California. I'm here to tell you of my own personal experiences after I decided that I would not accept the mandatory anthrax vaccine. I believe that other Marines refusers have also shared some of some or all of my experiences. The views that I express here are my own and not meant to reflect those of the U.S. Marine Corps. Since this is the first time I've been to Washington, my dad and I spent Sunday afternoon touring the historical sites such as the Lincoln, Monument, Lincoln Memorial, Washington Monument, and the Vietnam Veterans War Memorial. At each, I saw the words justice, democracy, liberty, and independence. These are concepts that, is, that this great capital represents to me. They are the things America is based on, and they are the things our military is sworn to protect and uphold. I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in June of 1997 because I believed it is stated, believe in its stated values of pride, honor, and dedication. However, when I and other Marines began to ask our commanders questions about the safety and effectiveness of the anthrax vaccine, they responded in ways that, in my opinion, lacked respect for our fundamental legal and democratic rights as citizen soldiers. Like many Americans of my generation, when I felt a need to learn more about the vaccine, I went first to the internet. Here I quickly learned that there were a number of unanswered questions about this vaccine, particularly as it was being used to protect us from inha inhaled anthrax spores. I was especially concerned that there was more debate about whether the vaccine would keep us safe if bioweapons were to be used on the battlefield. The fact that there has had been no research on whether the vaccine could give could cause sterility birth defects or cancer also worried me. Not to mention when we had the opportunity to get educated by our command. Questions that were to be answered by the medical officers at the interviews were ceased and questions were stopped. We were no longer allowed to ask any more questions. When we were, when we were called to take the shot for the first time in Okinawa, it was not the normal shot, shot procedure. A normal shot procedure that I am familiar with in the Marine Corps is going into a medical facility, the medical personnel having shot record, a medical personnel having computer, and one medical personnel giving the shot. They are being recorded on computer and on medical record. In this case, the shot was given in a long line with one piece of paper, such like this, with a list of names, and they were highlighted through once they received the shot. No medical records were present at the time of the shot. 27 of us announced that we, were, we would refuse the shot. After much, much pressure and many threats, all but five of the initial resistor, resistors in my, in my battalion gave in and accepted the vaccination. Like the other four, I was given non-judicial punishment in Article 15. My sentence was 30 days restriction, 30 days extra duty, and the forfeiture of $539 pay, which is one half month's pay for two months. Some of the other refusers were forced to walk approximately 16 miles each day during the weekends and holidays and many miles other days since the battalion office was a half a mile from the barracks and that we had to sign the duty book at the location almost every hour from 7 a.m. to 9.45 p.m. When two weeks of punishment period had passed, another anthrax vaccine was scheduled and once again I was called in in order to take the shot. I was again charged and put up for an, another non-judicial punishment. During this Article 15 proceeding, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Navarre, my battalion commander, ordered me to provide him with the phone numbers of my mother's employer, a doctor in general practice back in California. This frightened me because I didn't want my, refu my refusal to affect my mother's job in any way, as she is a nurse. Despite my fear, I told Colonel Navarre that I didn't believe I had to answer the question like that. He then punished me a second time. This time I received 45 days restriction, 45 days extra duty, including signing in the logbook every hour and another half month's pay loss for each of two months. And this time I received a reduction of rank from Lance Corporal to Private First Class. To be honest, this, this constant harassment and punishment were heavy on my spirit and morale, yet I was, I was able to stick to my resolve not to, not to be vaccinated because of the strong support I received from my wife who was also a Marine, and my family. My fellow refusers were also a source of support also. 
Finished with our six month deployment to Okinawa, my unit returned to Torian Palms, California, where I naively perhaps hoped that my situation might change for the better. Once I completed, completed all my punishment for both non digital punishments, I submitted a request for leave. I was not even allowed to fill out a leave request. My command made it clear that any leave request would be denied. I was told that I could not leave the base because I had refused anthrax shot and therefore did not deserve to go on leave. At this point, my family and I agreed that I needed outside legal help to help me cope with the unending harassment. My brother had attended an anthrax town mini, which had been sponsored by the GI's rights group, Citizen Soldier of New York. The event, the event was held in San Diego. My father contacted the director, Todd Ensign, and he put me in touch with Louis Font, a Boston lawyer who specializes in military defense work. I learned on April 10, 1998, the Deputy Assistant Judge Advocate General had sent an internal memorandum to all Navy and Marine Corps judge advocates. This memo concludes that after punishment for a first refusal, refusal to obey additional orders to be vaccinated for anthrax cannot form the basis for additional convictions at non-judicial punishment or court-martial. The Marines have violated this attorney's memorandum in, in my case. I, had been, I have been doubly punished and now I face special court-martial. I believe it is immoral, unethical, illegal, and wrong that I have been punished twice at NJP and now face a court-martial when Marine Corps lawyers have been before them the internal memo that states that this is an unlawful. My father called my battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Navarre, and he said that his hands were tied and he was only following Marine Corps Commandant policies. He said the policy is an NJP for the first refusal, NJP for the second refusal, and a special court-martial for the third. After my attorney explained to me the legal issue, I gladly signed a petition of extraordinary writ, which we filed on Monday, March 22, 1999, before the Navy Marine Corps Court of Criminal Appeals at Washington Naval Yard. It asked that the second NJP be set aside and that no court martial be allowed for this refusal. I asked that Congress investigate whether the Commandant of the Marine Corps has an illegal policy and whether subordinate commanders such as my battalion commander are subjecting listed men such as myself to multiple punishments as a result of this policy. It seems to me, at the, seems to me that the reason of, for the policy and the reason the Marines are disregarding their own legal memorandum is to keep the number of refusers so low that Congress will be misled into thinking that the compliance is virtually total. I had never before disobeyed an order, and my unblemished record reflects my desire to be a dedicated Marine. I love the Marine Corps and everything it stands for. When it, when, when it came time for me to accept this vaccine, I felt in my heart, mind, body, and soul that I was doing the right thing by refusing. I accept, I appreciate hearing the testimony of the high, highest ranking military health authorities who have testified today, and it made me respect even more the committee's willingness to, and desire to hear the point of view of an enlisted person at the lowest echelon. Thank you very much for having me testify today. I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, um, um, Mr. Lundbaum. I will go to Mr. Zaid. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you and offer my comments on the Pentagon's anthrax vaccination program. My remarks are my own opinion, not that of my organization, the James Madison Project. I've been involved in this controversy since April 1998 when I was requested to represent one dozen sailors who were refusing the vaccine aboard the USS Independence. In June of 98, I filed a lawsuit under the Freedom of Information Act for information on the anthrax vaccine. And most recently, I served as the lead civilian defense counsel for Airman Jeffrey Bedendorf, who was the first serviceman to face court martial for refusing to take the vaccine. My oral testimony will focus on the circumstances arising when a member of the military refuses the vaccine and the exposure of several significant problems with the Pentagon's policy. After being retained by the independent sailors, I investigated the prospect of a class action lawsuit in order to halt the program. The planned strategy was to challenge the safety, effectiveness, and necessity of the vaccine. Legal research, however, quickly revealed that the likelihood of success was virtually non-existent. The focus then turned to obtaining information. The FOIA lawsuit against the departments of Army, Navy, and Air Force, and FDA was quite comprehensive. It sought all data that related to the anthrax vaccine. The overwhelming majority of the released documents have never been publicly discussed before today. Let me first address the legal issues, which are actually very straightforward. There's no set policy as to how a refusal will be dealt with. 
except as to any, as any other military discipline problem. Because of the sensitivity surrounding the program, many officers first emphasize counseling and education before imposing punishment. Some, however, resort to threats of force, although official departmental policy is that no force will be used. Until recently, the military had been fairly consistent in imposing penalties. Typically, the following would happen. A soldier refuses the vaccine. He's taken to an Article 15 non-judicial proceeding. He's found guilty, reduced in grade, fined, restricted to ship or base, and assigned extra duty. Eventually, he would be administratively discharged. If he had a clean disciplinary record, a general discharge under honorable conditions would likely be approved. In at least two cases that I know of, even where an individual went AWOL, a general discharge was still granted. It was only a matter of time, however, before someone would proceed to a court-martial. Airman Jeffrey Bettendorf, who was stationed at Travis Air Force Base in California, followed the typical pattern at first. Clean record, wife, child, church-going, basic Boy Scout. Unlike prior cases, somewhere in his chain of command, someone wanted to set an example, and Airman Bettendorf found himself facing a court-martial. The key issue in an anthrax refusal case becomes whether the order to take the vaccine was lawful. The biggest battle is that the vaccine is FDA approved. Therefore, the order is presumed valid. From my work on Gulf War syndrome issues, I was aware of theories that the vaccine had been modified in order to hasten or increase its potency. Therefore, our primary defense strategy was that the order was unlawful because the vaccine being used may not have been FDA approved and was therefore experimental. As a matter of law, consent was required. It was also our position that legal precedent gave us the right to challenge the safety, effectiveness, and necessity of the vaccine. Through discovery, we pushed for samples of the vaccine for independent testing. But before we went to trial, the Air Force agreed to accept Airman Bedidoff's earlier request for a discharge, and he was processed out of the service under other than honorable conditions. Airman Bedendorf's case has unfortunately now changed the game plan. Rather than a discharge, refusers will now face much greater process, prospects for a court-martial. And once a conviction is obtained in even one case, a precedent will be set that will be nearly possible to overcome absent extraordinary circumstances. Let me now address some very important concerns about the program, and I'll do so through the Pentagon's own model of fact versus myth. Myth. The vaccine has been routinely used in the U.S. since 1970. Fact. No industry routinely uses this vaccine. Some use can be found among veterinarians and livestock workers, but no evidence of widespread usage. And if you ask someone from one of these two fields about use of the vaccine, the typical response is, what vaccine? In fact, only about 30,000 individuals have received the vaccine since 1970, and relatively few people outside of the military receive a shot each year. The private sector uses between 400 and 500 doses per year. This amounts to perhaps 100 to 300 people per year using the vaccine. The inoculation of 150,000 servicemen during the Gulf War was the first major use of the vaccine in any significant quality. Six times the number of people were inoculated than had been in, six, in 30 years prior. Myth. There has been no long-term side effects from this vaccine or no long-term consequences have been demonstrated. Fact. These statements are totally insupportable. The Defense Department has never researched whether use of the vaccine may result in long-term health consequences. In fact, no studies, either in the public or private sector, have examined potential long-term consequences. The manufacturer's label itself reveals that no cancer or fertility studies have ever been performed. When confronted with these statements of facts, the Pentagon's PR machinery responds, vaccine's been used for 30 years, it's unethical to conduct tests on humans. No one's calling for the tests, initiation of tests on humans. Accepting the Pentagon's assertions, however, that the vaccine's been widely used, how difficult would it be to locate a few hundred or more than maybe a thousand of people who once took the vaccine and after taking into account all appropriate variables, examine their health? Do they suffer from cancer, leukemia, Alzheimer, any medical malady? Can it be traced to the vaccine? When 2.4 million lives are at stake, there's a moral, if not legal, responsibility of the Pentagon to undertake such effort rather than offer excuses. Myth, a safe and effective vaccine is available that will protect our forces. Fact, we've discussed there are some issues of other spores uh, and mutations, so I won't comment more about that. But withheld from the public's knowledge until our FOIA lawsuit was that the Pentagon discovered years ago, it was briefly mentioned earlier, that the current vaccine, vaccination series of six shots is outdated and unnecessary. 
In September 96, the vaccine manufacturer, with the approval of the Army, filed an initial investigational new drug application with the FDA to reduce the vaccination schedule. The new proposal would be two initial doses with annual boosters as compared to a series of six doses over 18 months. Despite ample proof of the redundancy of the six-shot series, the Pentagon still implemented the current program. By not waiting for FDA approval, the Pentagon cost taxpayers at least an additional $32 million in vaccination costs. My final comments pertain to the adverse reaction rate. The manufacturing label for anthrax states that systemic reactions occur in fewer than 0.2% of recipients, and that's characterized by malaise, malaise and lassitude. Chills and fever were reported in only a few cases. The real truth, however, has been that systemic reactions among those in the military have been nearly seven times greater. Internal documentation we obtained revealed that up to 1.33% of recipients were suffered a systemic reaction. And it's vitally important to understand what is meant by a systemic reaction. It is potentially extremely harmful and possibly fatal. And while a percentage rate of 1.33% may not seem high, when applied to the fact of 2.4 million servicemen receiving the vaccine, this means that as many as 32,000 servicemen may suffer serious or fatal reactions. Reports of systemic reactions such as fever and prolonged muscle, muscular weakness have been occurring since the program began. Even more shocking, we've heard stories that medical officers have been reluctant or even refused to file adverse reaction reports and that they routinely try to convince the servicemen that what you're suffering has something to do with something else, not the vaccine. The Pentagon's response has been to distribute, and I don't say this lightly, disinformation by manipulating the statistics and the words. Documents that are now publicly disseminated assert that systemic reactions of 0.2% or more are very rare, which is contrary to its own reports, and more importantly, that fever and chill symptoms have been now recategorized as severe local reactions rather than the systemic that they are. This gives the false impression that such reactions are common when the fact is a re such a reaction could be deadly. Mr. Chairman, it is a sad fact that we regulate industries such as machinery and automobiles far better than we do those that affect what we may be placed in our bodies. The anthrax vaccine currently in use for the military would probably not withstand FDA scrutiny today were it applied for a license, yet no one seems concerned that we do not know whether this vaccine is actually a safe product over the long term. No one seems alarmed that the adverse reaction rates exceed the figures supplied by the va ma uh, vaccine manufacturer itself, or that the Defense Department has sought to masquerade these ill effects through questionable word wording changes. To be sure, as you said earlier, anthrax is an intensely dangerous biological weapon. It's imperative that we seek out ways to adequately detect the spores before contact and protect ourselves afterward. But the Penta Pentagon's anthrax program represents nothing more than an easy out from the hard task of devoting time and money to developing adequate detection equipment and, if possible, efficient vaccines that are truly safe and effective. The Pentagon has knowingly misled the American people concerning this vaccine. Whether in 20 years from now, advanced medical technology will demonstrate that the vaccine was either dangerous or safe, is anyone's guess, but until we know the full facts, 2.4 million people are potentially being placed in harm's way. And until the proper studies have been undertaken, the United States should follow the, the lead of the United Kingdom and implement its anthrax vaccination program as voluntary. Sorry for going over time. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Mr. Zaid, I'm not a, a great fan of class action suits, but your, uh, your questions were very provocative. Uh, before I just go to, to Mr. Handy, it, it, I just want to be clear, it's your testimony that only between 100 and 300 people in the United States in the private sector take this vaccine a year? Based on documentation and reports, and I believe, I think that <coughs> dosage came from an article in the San Diego Tribune, uh, Union Tribune, it indicated, and I believe it refers to the private sector, that between four and 500 doses per year, per year are used which, given the FDA-approved six-shot series, I would presume that is only of 100 to two or 300 people. Well, even if you were off by 1,000, it's still... It, we're talking a very, very small number. Well, uh, Mr. Chaney, I'm going to get right to you. I just will say uh, that this is the first of, of many hearings, and I found myself wanting to ask a question based on what you said of our previous panel. But we're, we're going to have the FDA in front of us, and we're going to nail some of this down. Uh, 
uh, and we'll try to do it fairly quickly. Um, Mr. Handy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I sincerely appreciate the committee's inviting me to discuss my concerns about the policy. I'm grateful this important issue is receiving serious review. Before proceeding, I would ask the committee to enter my written testimony in the record, along with supporting documents, which I will provide in full shortly after the hearing. I am here today only as a <coughs> private citizen. I am not speaking on behalf or in an any official capacity on behalf of the Department of Defense, the Air Force, or the Reserve Officers Association, which selected me as its most outstanding individual Air Force to reservist in the nation in 1996. I am a colonel in the Air Force Reserves, promoted just last summer. Last fall, the Air Force selected me for a four-year, full-time military position in the Pentagon. I elected not to pursue that job. Right now, I am seriously considering early retirement, which will mean a voluntary reduction in rank and pay to lieutenant colonel. Why would I forego the remainder of my career in protest over a shot I won't even face for several years? I care deeply about the integrity of my DOD employer and my service, but I am thoroughly dismayed by a tidal wave of information and abuse, which is causing widespread damage to the dignity and the devotion of our nation's defenders. Mr. Chairman, my hope is that the deception stops here. Let me be specific about just some of the disturbing information which is causing reactions in the ranks. First, key experts consider vaccines a useless defense against biological warfare. Second, major medical journals give no credence to the claims that anthrax vaccine will work against inhaled anthrax in particular. Third, and this is important, Fort Detrick studies show the anthrax vaccine has an 82 to 100% failure rate in the studies that DOD is ignoring, is ignoring in their own data. Fourth, as already mentioned, the Joint Staff may be developing as many as 50 or more other vaccines which could, could provide additional sources of misery for our dedicated soldiers, sailors, and airmen. Fifth, nearly 50 documented types of side effects already occur with this vaccine. Sixth, if you think of challenging the statement that the vaccine is FDA approved, but as Mark Sade just pointed out, we wonder and have heard that it would not be approved using today's standards. And lastly, and from perhaps most ominous, the DOD intends to increase its role in state biological disasters according to several reports. In other words, if this prospect materializes, the DOD may also abandon informed consent principles and proper procedures in the civilian community. I feel this policy must, must be addressed early before any more damage is done to morale, recruiting, retention, and combat effectiveness. We are potentially witnessing the slow but systematic dismantling of a yet formidable total force with balanced contributions from the Guard and Reserve. An Air Force Reserve pilot recently remarked, for the past two months, I don't know if I'm coming or going. Being in the reserves these days is like being on active duty full time. Our guys have been making a lot of sacrifices to do this job. We've reached the breaking point and the anthrax issue was basically the last straw. Mr. Chairman, I'd I would like to humbly suggest several useful congressional actions regarding the specific vaccine and DOD practices in general. First, I believe it would be most beneficial for the Congress to require DOD to cease its baseless marketing claims of the vaccine as safe and effective. Also, perhaps a funding moratorium could be established, could be imposed on the vaccine program, and money could be used to study its ramifications so that both military and civilian doctors understand how to treat all 50 side effects. Although a catastrophic reaction has not occurred yet, people have been hospitalized. And the close friends and relatives of our soldiers, sailors, and airmen already consider this situation totally unacceptable. Finally, I would ask the committee to require DOD to develop regulations and policies that would treat individual service members with respect on medical matters. I would suggest those policies include full medical workups prior to inoculation, allergic reaction assessments, the right of informed consent on questionable vaccines, FDA approved or not, full disclosure of risks and side effects by a non-DOD paid expert, and the right to exercise personal religious beliefs to decline questionable vaccines regardless of church affiliation or stated written doctrine. I believe the era of the mandatory use of questionable vaccines must be terminated for the health of the force. Our allies who don't do this to their soldiers also don't have Gulf War Syndrome, or they've addressed their mistakes 
and offered voluntary vaccines. Mr. Chairman, I am sure that every member of the Armed Forces will be grateful for your support and care in this matter. I thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Handy. Uh, Ms. Greenleaf. Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, we need to give you that mic. <laughs> then we can move the yellow papers and you can put it in front of you a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am privileged to appear before you to present a personal viewpoint on the anthrax vaccination policy adopted by the Department of Defense. The position I present today is not only my own, but is shared by concerned parents, spouses, family members, and friends of military personnel who are unfortunate and often unwilling participants in a policy which is believed to be misleading to military personnel and the American public. Our views are neither radical nor unfounded, nor are our sons and da daughters and spouses troublemakers, as implied by government officials who are in charge of either implementing the policy or presenting an acceptable public relations position to the general public and the media. Needless to say, the people who have refused the vaccine are volunteers, and in some cases come from families who have a history of military service. These men and women are often well-trained, intelligent, and articulate. They are truly, in many cases, the best and brightest of their generation, trained in nuclear technology, air combat and flight, and constitute a cross-section of the fields of tr training and study offered by the military. Yet faced with an order to take the vaccine without reasonable answers to reasonable questions, these men and women have been born to pressure and coercion of the military authorities. They have suffered reduction in rank, reduction in pay, restriction of liberty and dismissal from the service, all because they refuse to accept the assurances of the authorities that the vaccine is safe and effective. The DOD points to the numbers and says, look at how many people support our policy. What they don't tell you is that many personnel cannot afford to say no, cannot afford to take a reduction in grade and pay, and as a result are pressured into su subjecting themselves to the needle. There is more resistance out there to this policy than the numbers support. Unfortunately, the military sidesteps the issues of the safety and efficacy of the vaccine with its dictate. It's an order. We do not stand against this policy without medical support. Doctors Merrill Nass and Victor Seidel, two prominent physicians in the United States, have expressed similar doubts in articles written for various scientific and medical journals. The policy has had a negative effect on United States military preparedness and expertise. The recent resignations of Connecticut Air National Guard pilots cost the U.S. government the skill and training of fighter pilots who had a history of service and were willing to continue to put their lives on the line in Iraq or other unfriendly combat zones. Two U.S. Navy nuclear trained personnel aboard a nuclear aircraft carrier were recently disciplined and dismissed from the service for failure to take the vaccine. More trained and qualified personnel are on the horizon asking for answers. The answers are not forthcoming. And the response of the military is to take these well-trained men and women, refuse them answers, and discharge them for insubordination. All this in a context of concern among the military's own recruiting commands that the military cannot attract or keep qualified people. Look at what is happening to these young people and ask yourselves, why is there a reluctance of younger people to join our armed forces? I am the mother of a young sailor who has completed his service. My son took the vaccines and I'm upset that the military has indifferently cast aside questions of its safety. I'm upset that the quality control questions on the production of the vaccine have remained unanswered. I am further upset that my son, as well as all military personnel, have possibly been inoculated with a vaccine, the safety which is a big concern and which may not even work. To subject our men and women of the armed forces to a vaccine which is possibly unsafe, unreliable, and ineffective is to subject all such personnel to a misguided impression that the vaccine will protect them from all strains of anthrax, regardless the manner of exposure. It's an Alice in Wonderland approach to a problem it is one shared by me and thousands of men and women all over this country. On behalf of myself, my family, and on behalf of the men and women who have had the courage to stand up to this misguided policy, I thank you for the opportunity in allowing me to speak today. 
you all have made a very valuable uh, contribution and have given us um, areas to focus in on as a committee that we won't uh, fully get into today, uh, but we will get into. I'm going to, uh, uh, when I uh, come to my question, uh, Mr. Dingle, I'm allowed you to go through that list and just give me reactions, but um, I'm going to, uh, uh, at this time, uh, um, recognize um, my colleague from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just as a group want to say about your testimony that I don't think anyone who was listening to the testimony could doubt, one, its sincerity, or two, the real commitment that you have to um, our armed services and that you are, um, your, your strong belief and your, your commitment and as good Americans. So I just wanted to, to say that that came through to me strong and clear and that there's clearly a, a difference of, of opinion here. Um, I wanted to um, ask you if we really know, is it Colonel Handy? You said that there has been no catastrophic occurrence. And given the large numbers of people that have currently had um, the anthrax vaccine, um, don't you think that there's something reassuring about that? Reassuring that the uh, catastrophic uh, event, some kind of catastrophic event has not occurred? Yes. When you look at the number of people who will be vaccinated and the risk that's involved uh, with the numbers, who eventually 2.5 million people, I, I find it unusual that we are jumping from, um, in the Gulf War, 150,000 to 2.5 million uh, based on, on shaky grounds. That's a 17-fold increase in the number of vaccinations that will be given compared to the largest number given previously. And I think the risk would be uh, extremely large in that case that there, there is certainly a greater chance, a much greater chance that that could happen. Um, I, I also think that uh, given uh, the, the situation where we've had people in the hospital already, uh, and if you look through the 50 uh, reactions so far, you find some that are kind of disturbing, the blackouts uh, for one. And yeah, I think there's, there's one uh, that Lori mentions on uh, a case that's being reviewed now where there was a, a behavioral, a severe behavioral problem uh, that occurred with a person who has not had any behavioral problems apparently in, in his life. So I think that so, so you essentially you're, you're not comforted. You say that there are there, in your view there's enough evidence that multiplied many times that there could. I'm wondering if any of you would say that there is an acceptable level of adverse reaction, or if we have to to seek out a vaccine where there is none at all. Congressman, obviously, we're at somewhat of a disadvantage of answering what is predominantly a medical question. But obviously, you have reactions to vaccines. Almost every type of vaccine invariably produces some sort of reaction. Uh, that's not the issue. The issue in this case is the extent of the adverse reactions and the, and the level of it, particularly being that the adverse reactions being seen amongst our troops are up to seven times greater than what the manufacturer and the FDA has essentially approved. And that should be alarming. And I've only seen it downplayed in all uh, public comments. Uh, I would love to hear a public comment from the Pentagon in reaction to that. I've seen m much of their internal documentation. Their internal documentation, I can tell you, and I've provided it to the subcommittee, differs from what they have said publicly and has as to how they have categorized adverse reactions and the rate of adverse reaction. And, and if I might, with respect to what you had asked for Colonel Handy, there's another story down below the surface that really hasn't come out to the public. Now, those of us that have worked on the issue have been aware of it because we speak very often to family members and service members. The level of opposition has been much greater than has been publicly acknowledged by the Pentagon. 
it just hasn't reached the level of punishment. So, uh, there were times where I would receive a call and being told that units had 200 people initially trying to refuse the vaccine. Ultimately, it only dwindled down to a few, typically because either some were persuaded, they, they, they read the information, they felt that they were content enough to take the vaccine. Most cannot refuse because of their level of seniority. They can't give up the, the salary. They can't deal with the possibility of having losing a career in the military for this. Some have been threatened. Uh, we've had many reports of threats. It's not a widespread policy, but I can tell you it's occurred. We had situations like in Mrs. Greenleaf's son's case where opposition to the initial shot occurred, punishment occurred, but then the, the soldier consented to the vaccine. Those numbers are not being counted. The real impact upon the military will not be coming from the active duty. It will come from the reserve and the National Guard units. We've had almost two, at least two units, Connecticut and at Travis Air Force Base, where the, the Guard units who can just up and quit, as we've heard, have almost become non-deployable. Now, they didn't, but we had not just mechanics. My client at Travis Air Force Base uh, repaired equipment. Uh, we're talking pilots quitting over this. That's where the impact will be, and we haven't really seen the true extent as to how the Guard units will react. I'm, I'm a little disturbed by that route of argument as well, saying that because uh, members of the armed services have objected to an order, then therefore it's by definition our obligation to rethink that, to rethink that order. I mean, one certainly wouldn't want to argue that in a combat situation if there were some resistance to going into combat. So what is it about this that makes it unique that because there have been refusals more perhaps than you say there are, then we have to rethink our policy? I mean, that is true. There is a grave danger to refusing a lawful order. Uh, under military law, there is an ability to challenge even the lawfulness of an order. Uh, many times I would presume it probably fails. In, in this circumstance, I think a lot of the reaction certainly comes from a lack of credibility in the Pentagon from past problems. The chairman mentioned some of them earlier. That's not necessarily a reason why to create serious doubts, but that has certainly fueled fear amongst uh, service members. The true impact comes from when you consider some of the policy implications and, again, some of the issues the chairman raised, why anthrax, uh, why, in fact, internal documentation we obtained in the lawsuit demonstrated that during the Gulf War, when another FOIA requester had asked for similar information on vaccinations, the Pentagon said, we cannot, re we cannot release this information. It's harmful to our interests because we would be telling our enemies how many people we vaccinate, what we're vaccinating them against, how, what's our stockpile of vaccines. That was back in 91. And the reason being was, if a biological or chemical weapon is going to be used against you, you don't want to tell your enemy that you're vaccinated against that because at least hopefully they'll use something that you are vaccinated against rather than being hit by something else. So now from a policy standpoint, I'm not a military strategist, but this is fueling a lot of the growing fear, particularly among the family members. Why publicize this? Would not, as the chairman suggests, our enemies just shift over to another weapon? That's some of the issues. It's a very in-depth process, obviously. Well, and, and a number of those questions, I think, are medical questions, and the FDA may be able to shed some light on that. I'm glad that the chairman said we'll have an opportunity there. I, I wanted to get into some of the pressure tactics that, that were used, and not at length, but I, I'm just concerned. You said that th there were um, five others or five of you total who ultimately refused. Were these kinds of pressure tactics kind of standard operating procedure where you were? Have you heard of others? Is this the, so, so when we get these numbers of refusals, are, are they skewed based on those kinds of, ta of those pressure tactics? Um, Ma'am, in my situation, uh, we were pretty isolated. We we're on the island of Okinawa, Japan. So we, we didn't really know about any of the other, how other units were handling the situations. Um, but with us, before the shots even came up to be taken, um, 
the command took initiative and asked who has doubts about this, who is confused about this. And when they saw the alarming number of people stand up and say, well, I really don't want to take this vaccine, including a many, many number of people that were soon to be getting out of the military who wouldn't be able to allow, be allowed to finish the, the cycle of the 18 months. Um, they had classes after classes, counseling, and then, they, then we started getting rumors cycled through that the pun, what the punishments might be. Uh, time in prison, up to two years, we were told. Uh, dishonorable discharges. Um, threatened that, you know, you're ruining your, your military career. You're going to ruin any chance of a, a, of a successful civilian career. Um, this scared a lot of people because we, we have people in the unit that have, have uh, wives, children, and other family members that they need to take care of. Um, so this scared a lot of people, and when the shot finally came around to it, they pretty much had no choice but to take the vaccination. And when we were in the theater, when we, got the, when we were told we were going to have the opportunity to ask questions, at first they told us you know, their information that they had, and then once it came around to us asking questions, the people answering the questions may just have been a little underskilled in the field. They just might not have had the knowledge, but they couldn't answer the questions. And with that, the congregation of military personnel became heated, and they were, they were quite distraught and the command halted questions. They stopped questioning and that was it. No more questions, you're taking a shot. Thank you. Did anyone else wanna to respond to that? I, I'd like to make a comment. The depart, uh, Sue Bailey, I, I believe it was, Dr. Bailey said that there had only been eight adverse reactions reported to the FDA on the vaccine. Um, I have the current VARES report. You'll find that in my written testimony. There have been 84 reported with six hospitalizations and two life-threatening situations. Um, the military medical facilities are doing a horrible job of reporting these adverse reactions. Um, these people are being told they've got the flu, go lay down, you'll be okay in a few days. Um, after receiving the inoculations, these symptoms start within hours. Um, my son is, is now suffering adverse reactions from the vaccine and we had to complete the VAERS form ourselves. The military did not do this. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank I did you, have one thing to add, if you don't mind. I think uh, myself and, and Major Dingle, you know, we're fighter pilots. We, we seek out root causes for problems. Uh, personally, I, I have witnessed a very unfortunate event in my unit, one that I think is going to occur in many units across the country in our reserve components and that's the implementation of this policy. As fighter pilots, we tend to look for root causes. I don't think our units are to blame. I think the policy is to blame. I think that many believe, and all the questions that are arising show the policy be, to be hard to defend. There are many inconsistencies. I'd like to point out just a couple more of the inconsistencies that were disturbing to us and caused us to make these major decisions in our careers. The long-term studies that the Department of Defense maintains by this committee's opening statements concurs are in question as well the widespread use of late there was an article in the national guard association magazine that talked about the national uh, bovine ranchers association they had no knowledge of this vaccine even a comment by mrs bailey earlier today she mentioned that there were 634 troops that had taken the vaccine that number is widely inflated. I think what she meant to say was doses. But I guess my question as a service member is, why are we creating a number concerning doses in order to try to create the impression of a greater sample size that's being inoculated? It comes down to trust. These are issues of trust. We are not in a combat situation, but when we are in a combat situation, that is a vital element of our ability to, to perform. Another example, we had a, a, a disagreement earlier about uh, whether or not the FDA had forced the close down of the plant. The Department of Defense continues to maintain, there's been letters to the editor that maintain uh, that the FDA didn't cause that. But Dr. Burroughs, in his letter, he was sanctioned by the Department of Defense to do a study, agrees, it's in our written testimony, that the shutdown was due to the FDA pressure. As far as numbers go, 
most of us feel like the first initial step would be an optional policy so we can continue to sort through the program and the potential problems that there are. It's creating problems out in the field. We're allowing pregnant individuals not to take the shot. We're allowing religious refusers to not take the shot. And if the refusers of the vaccine on other grounds are so few, then perhaps they could be included as well while we continue to study the issue. Thanks for your time, ma'am. Let me um, um, start with you, Mr. Dingell, and say um, you, you reacted to the first panel and you wanted to make some comments. And I, I would welcome that. Um, and I would welcome any other of you um, making any comments to what you heard from our first panel. Thank you for this opportunity, and it, it may be a little disjointed uh, as I bounce around a little bit, and I'm not going to go through all of them. <clears throat> the DOD, the panel one, uh, along with all their staff and, and help, presented a very nice uh, full-color presentation for you. One of those large posters was the 42 uh, adverse reactions. General Blank indicated that he had a nodule and therefore an adverse reaction. I'd like to know if he was one of those 42, as was General Fisher. He said the side effects of his shots were less than those of other shots he has received. Are his actions, his re adverse reactions part of that 42? I think well, that's we'll, a, we'll find that out. That's, that's a, a good question, question that needs yeah. to be asked. You're um, making me regret you weren't on the panel asking questions. Dr. Bailey said that the anthrax was identified as a, at, right at the beginning, when her opening statement was that it was a critical uh, issue I, want, I was curious to know when that was identified. Was it identified in 96, 86, 76? Right. Also, that number of 42, let me go back to that again. I know of six in Connecticut alone. I have no idea if they've been reported or not up the chain of command. So that's some of the number stuff that I, I think needs to be, uh, and once again, uh, Mr. Zaid commented on that at length, the, uh, the numbers game. If you'll give me a a couple seconds to review sure. my notes. In fact, I'd be happy to have you review your notes if you want me to call on someone else and come Thank back. You. Anybody else want to react to the first panel? There was another figure mentioned that the uh, a reaction rate was 0 0.007%. Uh, that's quite an increase if you just do the math according to what was quoted earlier in uh, publications throughout the, the Department of Defense, for instance, the Capitol Flyer. Admiral Cowan was noted as saying it was 0.0002%. That means the decimal place goes over two more points, which really gets to be beyond the scope of believability because if you take the 0.0002% times the 2.5 million in, in service that will get the shot, you're saying that only five members in the service will have the s systemic reactions. So the 0.007% is now it's 175 if you do the math. Because again, 0.007% means you move the decimal place over again two points. And we've, as we've heard in testimony, the vaccine insert says it's 0.2%. That translates to 5,000 service members who will get systemic level reactions. For Dietrich studies, as Mark Zaid pointed out, at 1.3%, again, moving the decimal place over two, two digits, gives as many as 32,000. So the figures are all over the map, and, and it causes a, a great deal of uh, credibility problems in our, in our opinion. Any other observations? Um, actually, I would like to just kind of put a few questions out there, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, on page one of uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Sue Bailey's uh, testimony, um, she uh, had in paragraph two in about the middle of it, it says extensive immunization tracking, strong commander leadership with medical support. Um, I want to question the, the, the command leadership and with the medical support on the lower levels in such like battalions and, and platoons and, and squads where, where people are actually getting vaccinated. We don't all just go to a big hospital at the Pentagon and, and you know, get overseen. With my experience of watching 
all the members in my unit stand in a big long line and get vaccinated without their medical records on hand and then having their name just simply highlighted through a paper and supposed to be put into document into records later. Well, we had members that were on a, a rifle range detail who were going to miss their third shot. It goes first shot, spend two weeks, uh, second shot, another two weeks, and then third shot. Well, they were on a rifle range detail and they could not make their third shot. So they were going to go documentate that they were going to take their shot later than what FDA had approved it for. When they went down to do that, they had found that the first two shots hadn't been documented inside their medical records. Had so not, I just wanted to throw that question out there. Had not been documented. Had not been documented, sir. And also another uh, questionable thing on the testimony is on page three, um, and about the middle of the page, um, where it says Secretary Cohen, uh, you know, approved to, to implement in uh, May 18th of 1998. And again, towards the the right hand side of the the top paragraph below that. Uh, it says over a seven to eight year period. Well, that was true when they put it up for 2006 to complete the program, but since they bumped it up to 2003, from my understanding. And I just want to throw that question out there also. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other observations, Mr. Dingle? Yeah, if you have the moment, please indulge me uh, for maybe about 10 points, and uh, I don't necessarily want to generate a lot of discussion over them, but I'll just uh, like to enter them in the record as possibly a question for follow up sure, you're more than welcome investigations. To. I'll do it uh, chronologically from uh, the beginning of panel one's testimony. General Blank stated that uh, guinea pigs were not a good model for studying the effects of <clears throat> the anthrax, especially the aerosolized. If so, why is the most recent study presented, uh, which was presented in 19 September 98, conducted by Dr. Ivans from Fort Detrick, their, their uh, animal was the guinea pig. Why are they spending money on uh, studies using animals that are not you know, conducive. I, I'm not sure. I think there's some um, problems with using monkeys and stuff, but I, apparently there's, you don't have those ethic problems with whether it's rabbits or guinea pigs. So their, their most recent uh, publicly presented uh, study involves the use of the animals they say is not a good model. <clears throat> General Fisher said, uh, talked about the, uh, the criteria for filling out a VIRS form was 24 hours off of duty or hospitalization. I've talked with the folks at uh, the CDC slash VDA that run the VIRS program, and that is absolutely different from the, the folks there and what they would like to see reported. Any reaction whatsoever should be reported, and its use is basically as that as a, a post-marketing surveillance program to build the database for any and all drugs and vaccines, not just the anthrax vaccine, obviously. So I'm curious to know why the military definition for uh, a VIRS report, generating a VIRS report is so different than the rest of the, the society. Let's see. General Blank also stated that he was impressed by uh, a former, uh, I believe, general officer, uh, what he said a few years ago, that soldiers give up rights when you wear the uniform. I'd like to know specifically <coughs> which rights we give up when we, when we uh, took the oath to serve our country. I don't remember reading or uh, accepting any uh, abrogation of, of my rights. Dr. Bailey spoke later on of the uh, the threat risks we talked about. Could I could I just ask? Uh, I, I do think you give up some. Maybe it's a definition of rights. So um, yeah, I'm not sure how the, the term was I mean, used. But I would just be interested if that was. The, the military can tell you when to go to bed and when to wake up. Uh, you know when to get out. I mean, there are a lot of things they can tell you to do. They can't tell me to do. Point well taken. Yeah. So. I, I just I just thought it was a very strong statement. I, I wasn't sure yeah. if it, you know that that might that. That statement, I thought, in my, stuck in my mind. Okay. I thought I don't, you know, it can be discounted or whatever you want. Additionally, uh, later on, Dr. Bailey talked about the, the uh, when we were, you were discussing the, the 50 or so uh, biological agents with a piece of paper there that, uh, and, and why we weren't, uh, the DOD wasn't working to protect its uh, members against those threats. She talked about the need for threat risks are made for specific areas in the world. And with uh, Iraq being a particularly uh, sensitive one at the moment, Connecticut has lost a quarter of its pilots due to this measure, and, and they, are, they will be deploying later next week 
Transport Tour in Kuwait. Could I, could I just nail that down? Um, how many pilots are we talking about total? Nine pilots have, re have uh, declined to take the vaccine. Eight will eventually be leaving a unit, to my knowledge. One has out gone of, into a non-mobility position. Out of how many? Out of how many? Uh, at the time that uh, our, our take it or leave uh, policy was uh, enacted, there was 35 pilots, to my knowledge, on the, uh, on the base. Mm -hmm. So while we have left or are being forced out of the military in a career of service because of this policy, either right now or very shortly, another guard unit will be deploying to Northern Watch, flying over the same enemy or flying over the same country, Iraq, as we are going to, and they don't even know how to spell anthrax at their base. It has not been brought up. It has not been mentioned. Those people will be deploying to that area, and they haven't even addressed this issue yet. So, Mr. Ding, let me just ask a question that, that would gnaw on me if I didn't ask. Um, your unit is being deployed. Yes, is, sir. Is there some logic to make, can I make an assumption, and how would you counter this assumption, that some would find this a convenient way to be deployed? In other words, they can blame it on anthrax and therefore not have to take this assignment. You need, uh, he wants to respond, but I'm not sure. really sure what you're asking, sir. Yeah. What, I'm, what I'm asking is this. Uh, your unit is being deployed at an active duty, correct? Is that correct? We're not being activated. We will be put on active duty orders. We're not being activated, but we are supplementing the forces that are over in the area of responsibility. So I, for one, was on the deployment list, right. along with many of the other pilots. So let me just ask it for the record, and, and we'll just take the best answer you have. Is, is there is there danger that some are using, uh, and or let me put it this way, could some use this as a means for uh, not uh, being deployed? Uh, blame it on anthrax and, and therefore be reassigned or be able to resign. Let me ask you this first question. Do you have the ability to resign uh, from, from uh, this duty um, for any other reason? Yes, sir. You, 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 we, we, could, we could walk away from our citizen soldiers' responsibilities, but we don't choose to do that. Okay, this no, I, is the issue that came in the no, way no, of our me, service. Yeah, but, but let me just put it in this paper. Let me take my time here. You, uh, your unit is being deployed where? Where is it? Kuwait, sir. Okay. It's going to Kuwait uh, in, in a theater that's, that's pretty hot. Um, if you didn't, and, and uh, in your case, Mr. Dingle, and I, I believe the sincerity of all of you, I'm not questioning your sincerity, but I want to put on the record, um, by your um, refusing to take anthrax, you are not going to be going to Kuwait, correct? Is that true for both of you? That's correct. Yes, yeah. sir. If you didn't want to go to Kuwait, uh, would you be able to not go for another reason? just simply say, I'm getting out? Or wouldn't you have to go to Kuwait because you, you, you've signed up for a certain period of time? Sir, this is a, the way the Guard and Reserve works, uh, to the best of my knowledge. And uh, sure. I'm, I'm just a fighter pilot, and I don't want to slight my, uh, my military knowledge in all other areas. But it's voluntary. You can volunteer to go on the deployment or not. Most people sign up to go on, the, on, on these deployments. So. There are people that have just declined to not participate in this. It's, it's not, you know, while depending on the, on, the, on the seriousness of the deployment or, or the area of the world, people's personal civilian careers, what's going on in their, their civilian jobs, people either volunteer for deployments or not. It's, it's not a, everybody goes. In order to make the whole unit go uh, and make it mandatory and in order to go, I believe that Congress has to activate the unit. Okay. I, well, I, well I, I, that's your knowledge, and, and it may be the accurate one. And we'll Sir, and for the record, if, sure. I, if I may, I was on the deployment roster. I was ready and willing to go, and so were most of the other gentlemen right. that have left the unit as a result of this policy. I personally spent 122 days in Kuwait last winter on two back-to-back -back deployments, and I was more than willing to go again. I hear you. I personally have been in touch with many guardsmen and reservists around the country, Many agree, after self-educating themselves on this policy and looking into the issues revolving around it, that this could stand in the way of their continuing to serve. Right. It's just begun in the Guard and Reserve, and we're already seeing the losses. One of my, my fears is that, that the seven, or is it eight, who are basically uh, refusing to take anthrax and therefore will not be deployed, 
uh, and if they leave the service, it will be recorded as you're not necessarily liking the pay or you're not liking some other thing and that we need to... I, I, it'd be interesting to see how you, uh, how the, the eight of you will be recorded by the military. And so I think that's very important that we record it properly, that we attribute the losses appropriately. Unfortunately, uh, both the unit and the Department of Defense uh, mistakenly uh, recorded only two pilots actually re uh, being lost from the unit due to anthrax. In fact, it was all eight pilots that are transferring out of the unit that have been lost to anthrax. We put a letter together to that effect. We included it in our written testimony, and we feel it's most important that we attribute it appropriately. Now, will both of you give up flying, or will you be flying somewhere else? I, the nodding doesn't get me <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, it makes the cameras, but not the tape. Uh, if, this, if this program turned around tomorrow, we've been told that we are no longer welcome in our unit. I do not anticipate any unit uh, asking us to fly for them now or in the future, no matter what the outcome of this policy is. So I've resigned the fact that I'm going to hang up my G-suit and never fly for the U.S. military again. Now, do you fly commercially? Do you fly professionally? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. what, do, what do you fly? I fly uh, Boeing airplanes. Yourself, sir? McDonnell Douglas airplanes, right. sir. But it's a different kind of, of activity. It's Absolutely. Not, it's, yeah. a, it's a totally different uh, type of flying. Yeah. And so you're giving up a real love, aren't you? Uh, yes, sir. It's in fact uh, the military flying is uh, is how I got into it, and then the uh, the commercial flying is a is a secondary endeavor that, that occurred later. I hear you. Thank you. Yes, sir. And if I may, sir, I think it's a very important distinction to turn around that citizen soldiers are leaving the service of their country in order to concentrate on their families or civilian professions. I'd like to turn that right back around and say the reason we're serving is because we want to serve our country. And if our families are important to us and our civilian careers are so important to us, we have been for a long time making a sacrifice to serve, and we wanted to continue to do so. Thank you. Let me, um, I know I'm just focusing on the two of you um, uh, because I wanted to clarify uh, termination here, but I want you to react to Mr. Lumbaum's story and tell me how it's different from yours, because it is different. It's, uh, it's absolutely different, sir. Yeah. He's active duty and is... Uh, under the U.S. Code Title 10, I believe, I'm not sure if the Marines, but uh, the, the, the active duty UCMJ, we are technically, we are, we are militiamen. Uh, and unless uh, we've been federalized by the president, we work for the state, for the governor. We come under a completely different set of UCMJs, and we basically, we, we wear a couple of different hats, and today I'm a civilian. And, you, and when I go in and I'm on a, some sort of military pay status, that's when I put on my hat. Tell me how you react to his story. It's, it's different in terms of, of how he interacted with his superior officers. Uh, to me, it's, it's really disheartening to hear that, that type of story. As an officer, I think all officers, we, and we do agree, I'll even agree with the, the Surgeon's General, that uh, you know, taking care of our folks is a, is a top priority in all the decisions and the, the things that we do. So it is disheartening to, to hear of stories of this kind of treatment. And if I may, I would like to implore everyone to go back to the root cause of what might be causing the challenges to the UCMJ and what might be putting this great burden on the field commanders out there in the country. It's the anthrax policy and the controversies that revolve around it. Let me um, conclude this part and then I'm going to recognize the ranking member of the committee. Uh, we, we have 27 boxes that basically we've gotten from the Joint Program Office. We've gone through about five of the 27 boxes. And one of the, um, one of the documents I have before me is titled Procurement of Anthrax Vaccine Single Source Versus Additional Site. And it just kind of speaks in, in one way to, to, your, um, to a point you made, uh, Mr. Zaid. Uh, it has facts A, B, C, then 1, 2, 3 under C, and then it has four under C, and then it has D, and then E. It says, the original license for AVA, anthrax, was supported by efficient efficacy data obtained in a very small study of human, humans working in the wool sorting industry during the 1950s and 60s. More stringent FDA regulatory requirements for a vaccine produced by another manufacturer would likely require the development of a surrogate efficacy model. This is high risk because no model currently exists. Uh, the implication is uh, that the FDA standards today are quite different than they are 
30 years ago. Th that's accurate, and that, Mr. And that we're not quite sure how the FDA would view uh, this vaccine today. I, I, I believe I recall that document, as a matter of fact. It, the 1970 approved version was based on a 1962 clinical data study that was submitted, just one. It wasn't until 1972 that the FDA changed their requirements for biological vaccinations to make a stronger requirement for uh, efficiency studies and effectiveness studies. Uh, when the Gulf War, when Desert Shield started, and I've provided some of this documentation to you, I can give you even more. There was a task force put together uh, called Project Badger that looked into getting enough vaccinations for everyone in time for Desert Storm. And at this early date, even 10 years ago, the Pentagon knew that the current series that the FDA has approved was unnecessary. In fact, the history of it in, 19, in the 50s was a worker arbitrarily deciding six doses were appropriate. And, and I'll tell you, everything I say is from Defense Department documentation. This is all from internal government documentation provided to us in the FOIA lawsuit. Um, they tried to rush through to get the vaccinations. They approached countless laboratories. The problem was the FDA. And in fact, one document they indicate that if they're going to have a problem with the FDA, they're going to have to put some pressure on them. And that's where the waiver came from. Let me uh, just conclude by statement and then recognize Mr. Blavojevich. Um, I made an assumption uh, that I brought to the table, even before we had testimony from the first panel, that uh, this vaccine was in widespread use uh, in the private sector. Uh, your number of three to four hundred, uh, even if it was three to four thousand compared to what I thought it was, um, uh, is, a, is a big surprise to me. So I, I, it will be interesting to nail down that, that uh, number. Mr. One quick, the reason why there's only one major manufacturing plant is that it's not a cost-effective, profitable vaccine because nobody is using it besides the military. Mm -hmm. And it's very tough to manufacture in the sense that for spore-like vaccinations, you, you're not able to manufacture other types of vaccines in the same vicinity. So it's very expensive, mm -hmm. not cost per dose, but if you're going to make it your livelihood, it, you better have a good customer, like the Defense Department, who all of a sudden wants to vaccinate 2.4 million people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Private Lundblom, I'm going to be looking at you here on this question, but anybody is free to answer the question. And to the extent that you feel that you can go lower than private first class, Private Lundblom, don't answer this question. But uh, uh, we were given a briefing by the Department of Defense prior to this hearing. At that briefing, they provided us with a status report on the number of adverse reactions to the VIRS reporting system. We have that right here. This printout, uh, here you go. Um, this printout was from February of this year, and it shows that uh, the Army reported 22 um, adverse reactions. The Navy re reported five. The Air, po Air Force reported uh, 11 adverse reactions, but uh, the Marines list no adverse uh, reports. Uh, the question to you, Private, or anyone else, uh, is do you believe this is a result of pressure by commanders, especially in the Marines, not to report adverse effects? Um, first of all, um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, to respect for the United States Marine Corps and for my command, um, looking into the situation and the push punishment that I have received, and to respond to the comments you made uh, about losing rank again, um, I just I have received uh, new information just now from Congresswoman uh, Ellen Tauscher that my corps marshal has been dropped now, and by my merit, they are granting me an admin separation under general with honorable conditions. But to answer your question... Maybe you shouldn't answer the question in view of that. Private, why don't we just ask someone else? We don't want to get you in trouble. Let me, let me just say this to you. I, I, with respect to the military, they have, um, they have cooperated with us, and um, uh, they respect your testimony. And I, I know you're saying that in good faith, but I, I just want it clearly understood. I, I don't think anything uh, of ill will will go, come your way by being honest with us and and being respectful of the service that you love. I, I, I feel I can answer the question in a, in a manner that it's not any disrespect. Um, with the Marine Corps, as far as I'm concerned, 
and that's just a personal opinion, the Marine Corps is the best fighting unit in the United States military. But I'm a little biased because I'm part of that, part of that branch. But sitting where I sit, we have so much pride in ourselves and in what we do. And I think when, say, we complain about something, complain about a fact that a Marine to himself, unless you're in a lot of pain, right, don't even worry about complaining about it because it's no big deal. And that's the way I think most Marines feel. And that's not the way they're told to feel. That's just the way they feel. And I think that's why the reports are so low, just because it's, it's in our heads, it's in our hearts, it's just... You're tough Marines, you just don't complain. We're tough and, and we stick it out. And it's, it's, unless, if it was something serious, I'm sure they would have reported it um, if they felt like their health was endangered as like long-term sicknesses or something like that. But, you know, with just nodules on the arm and sore arm thing, people have told me, my arm is sore, you know, I got, my arm's been sore for a week. But they don't feel like it's takes precedence to report it just because they had to, don't feel it's necessary. Okay, so based on what you've seen, Private, or what you've not seen, in other words, you've not seen any indication that any commanders in the Marine Corps are putting pressure on any of you guys not to come forward? No, I've seen no reason. pressure. Okay, thank you very much, Private. Good well, luck to you. I, I really feel that the medical facilities are not instructed on what to do and when to report these adverse reactions. I'm aware of several cases where the service member went into the medical facility with a rash, vomiting, bloody diarrhea, and they're just told they have the flu. I'm not sure that they're, that they're aware that this needs to be done. Congressman, I, I might also uh, mention that I looked at the swine flu vaccine debacle in the 1970s, and the Journal of uh, American Medical Association had an article on that where they reported that the rate of adverse action re, uh, reports from the military were seven times fewer than that in the civilian population. I don't know what the causes were, but it was an interesting phenomenon. So there's perhaps precedence there, mm -hmm. perhaps due to the culture. Right, more cultural than any kind of purposeful cover-up. Yeah. Anybody else want to address that? Or? Well, I, I think that's right. From a command level, I certainly not aware of either any of my clients or any of the servicemen or their families that have contacted me that anyone is being threatened do not report adverse reactions there is a mentality among the military that unless as the private said you're truly suffering don't say anything uh, i certainly have received reports that medical personnel have downplayed as mrs greenleaf has said the significance of what our reactions to something, whether or not it's related to the vaccine, you know, I certainly don't know. But within a point in time sufficiently close in proximity to the vaccination that one would think the, mil the military medical personnel might want to explore a little further and they are, are telling people uh, that they're not going to file a an adverse reaction report. That, that is occurring. I'm not saying it's widespread, but there have been at least isolated reports of that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're going to conclude, but I, I welcome any of you having a closing statement, any observation you want to make. Um, is there anyone? Yes, sir. Can, can I just say just a couple of things in response to some comments made on the first panel real quick? Sure. And I can meet with your staffers at a, at a later date uh, about this. A, a couple of things that had been said. Medical records coming from the standpoint in at least the spring of 1998, when I was uh, very much involved on a more global scale, when it when more in the Persian Gulf were being vaccinated, uh, many of those from the independents that were contacting me and the John Stennis were not having notations placed into their personal medical records. Now, that might have changed. I, I hope and I'm sure it is better now. What's significant about that, though, is let's go back to the four conditions that were supposed to have been met before the program was implemented. And that was a key facet of it, that there had to be adequate medical record keeping. It wasn't, at least in the initial few months. And I would encourage the committee as well, I think I attached it as, append as uh, Exhibit 2, the independent evaluation of the vaccine, I dare say, is a document that you or I could write very easily by doing public research of available literature. There, there was no independent testing or evaluate, independent evaluation of this vaccine. And I'll leave it to you, just read the document and you can come to your own conclusion on that. Uh, much of the data that has been the basis for the Pentagon's decision is unpublished, 
And uh, let me just say finally in response to one thing Dr. Bailey had said about the cocktail mix, which you know from your Gulf War syndrome um, interest has been a significant factor. There was a memorandum, and I've given it to your committee, authored, by, authored for Dr. Edward Martin in 1995, who was the principal deputy to the Assistant Secretary of Defense, I don't know if that was Dr. Bailey at the time, from Brigadier General Ross Zachuk at the U.S. Army Medical Research and Material Command. And it said that a limited study was conducted at Fort Bragg and Fort Detrick and revealed that the combination of anthrax and botul I can't even say this, botulinum vaccine did produce mild and moderate reactions as well as a few serious side effects. So the government has data that is inconsistent what is being publicly reported to our servicemen, the public, and I dare say to the Congress. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, just a couple of uh, sure. qu yeah. quick items. Uh, it gets to a question that Ms. Schakowsky asked about what is different about this particular program or vaccine. And I think two areas are worth exploring, and I know you're going to have a, uh, a hearing on, on the doctrinal area, and I think that's, that's critical because we keep hearing the idea that this uh, threat, the biological warfare threat, in particular the vac anthrax threat, it's not a matter of if, but when. This is the kind of mentality that occurred also in the swine, in the swine flu uh, vaccine problem. Uh, th the fact is that the literature review, and even during that situation, showed that the risk was extremely small. The literature re review now says the same thing. It is also incalculable. The, f the problem with the phrase, it's not a matter of if but when, suggests that there is a 100 percent probability that there will be an anthrax attack and that all service members will be affected. Therefore, we must vaccinate all service members. And I think there is a patent fallacy in that in attempting to uh, create that kind of logic and I will appreciate the, the results of that uh, investigation. The other thing that uh, really gets to her question about the differences as to why this program is different. Uh, for most of, I would think, the members of the service, having 25 shots for one particular vaccine over a 20-year career is an amazing difference. That's what we're really talking about. With the standard vaccines that they either, our members have to have when they come in the service or even that they, that they get for deployments, and especially the pilots get a lot of those, this is still a significant increase. And in, in most people's minds, that's an imposing threat that is probably uh, sus uh, suspected to be more probable than an actual anthrax attack. And I think that's a big difference. Very interesting. Any other, um, anyone else like to make a final comment? I'd just like to thank you once again for the opportunity to to speak before the panel. Well, let me just say, um, it has been, you all have been very interesting and very helpful and, um, and very sincere. And um, you've served your country in various ways uh, that are quite significant. And um, you've taken a stand for something you believe in. And I really respect that uh, from all of you. And I thank you for coming. And stay sure. in touch. Yesterday's UN Security Council meeting on the military strikes in Kosovo, and that's followed by live coverage of the U.S. Senate.